Okay, so abstract particulars, truth and truth makers, part seven. It's time without our dear friend Kenny. It is Karen, Josh, and myself, Rodrigo. And we are reading, we just we are discussing chapter 12 from the EJ Lowe Truth and Truth Making volume, which is Josh Parsons. Are there irreducibly relational facts? I actually read this paper many years ago, but I didn't understand it then. Uh, if anything, it may be part of what lodged in my mind this idea that I ought to know something about truth makers. Mm -hmm. And it also, I think, inspired me to think about intrinsicality. Uh, since then, I have learned about intrinsicality, so I have that under my belt. And now we're doing truth makers. And I even also recently learned about Bradley's regress uh, and also um, some of the early chapters of analytic philosophical history. Uh, all elements that make up this very brief uh, but interesting paper. So um, gladly I can say that uh, I, I read this pretty easily in, in ways that I did not many years ago. So I'll be curious to hear what you uh, think of it all. Uh, it is yet another Australian, or at the least it was published in an Australian journal. And it's good stuff. I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely an important problem if we want to think of truth makers as anything like objects or parts of objects such as tropes. We have to deal with relations one way or the other. And, uh, and there are two very clear options. Uh, I found myself going back and forth between them, but settled on Parsons view, or not his view, but uh, the position he's defending, not, not for the same reasons exactly, but reductionism essentially. Uh, but I'm uncomfortable about the very last line of the paper where he says that this is to be an indication that perhaps yeah. know, philosophy <laughs> should not have rejected Hegelian idealism. Uh, I can't help but notice this is always, by the way, the mark of good philosophy in my world, in my experience. And that is that no matter how widely you try to read, it always seems to come back to the same things, things that you hadn't even realized until the very last few months of your own reading. It's a remarkable experience how it all keeps enveloping and back on itself. So the other thing I'm referring to is Brandon. We've been reading Brandon, who, uh, though he was uh, trained by, or had his dissertation, uh, um, let me call it um, sponsored uh, by David Lewis and Richard Rorty, a very odd combination. In fact, he's proud of saying that uh, they worked together only once, namely to supervise his thesis. Uh, despite that, he's telling us that we should all go back to Hegel, which is just, you know, just trying to understand that has been interesting and to see it come up here again. Um, it's very disturbing, especially since I'm usually trying to oppose Hegel and here I find myself in the same place. So. That's, that's what I've got. Uh, how about you? Josh, you've been reading Brandon too. I have. I have been reading Brandon. Uh, yeah, this was an interestingly short article. Um, <laughs> and it was nice having understood every single reference <laughs> in, a, in the paper. <laughs> um, yeah, that was nice. There's... Um, I, have, I, have, I have concerns and... I think, yeah, I have concerns, but I think I think broadly, I, I sort of agree with his reductionist project, but maybe may, maybe for different reasons, or maybe with some caveats. Namely, I, I'm I've been I've moved away from reductionism in general, certainly in relation to physicalism. I think it might be a mistake to to think of this too closely with physicalism reductionism, but it might be inevitable because there's something about the world, you know, the truth maker for a property. There's various properties in the world, like high level properties or these down to fundamental properties. You might hear this with reductionism and relations. But I think my mind was really focused on work that we were just reading in it as well. And that's where it kind of comes up and, and Brandon kind of comes up and there's this, um, 
this, this problem of communication is, as, as, as Davidson would put it, but it's, it's really this problem of relations in the world and how they make true any sentences that we might assert. So I don't know, all this is like kind of wrapped up in my head. I'm trying to understand this. I'm tempted to want to reduce these relations. Um, but I think some questions that I have are at the level of this distinction he makes. I guess this is the one aspect, aspect of the paper I was a little unclear on. He makes this distinction between intrinsicality and essentialism and kind of picks out where both of them sort of um, lead to reductionism. But essentialism has some extra difficulties. And I wasn't quite sure. I wanted to read more into that because uh, I, I, I liked his sort of intrinsic position, but I wasn't quite clear on the essential distinction. So I'm kind of hoping one of you could clear that up for me. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure this leads to reductionism. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I guess I'm, I understand the project, but I, I'm, I'm not sure that's quite the way it is. Um, my recent reading Wilson makes me um, sort of motivated to get away from this hardcore reductionism in terms of properties and entities. And if that's the case, there might be room for anti-reductionist account of truth makers. So that's something I really want to follow up on. And I think reading Jessica Wilson is going to help more. That's going to be about anti-reductionism and physicalism. But I think, of course, that's going to play into a truth maker um, theory that wants to be an anti-reductionist about religions. So it may be that there are entities in the world that are composed of these properties, but it it, it isn't that you can simply reduce them down to the, these properties. There's something about the constitution or the way that the, the fundamental properties compose in some way. I'm not sure if it's going to be an essential relationship. I think it probably will be. And then there might be something about that part whole relation that constitutes this relational fact. That's where I really want to explore and I'm sort of in form of the project as well. Um, but, but yeah, I don't know. I just have a lot of thoughts. Nothing, nothing finalized yet. Uh, Karen, did the audio crap out on you a little bit? Uh, when it did. Okay, so it's not just me. Yeah. Maybe it's your connection, Josh. Well, it, it is. is usually the best. Hmm. Could be all of anyway. our connections. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it's your, my yours. Was a little. Yours was a little choppy when you were talking. Ready oh, to go really? back. Mm. Well, Josh, this was worse. Yeah. Okay, well, let's just keep going. I, I, I did understand almost everything we'll you said, and we're going to revisit best. it anyway. Um, yeah, just briefly. Um, no, I'll, I'll get to it later. Uh, Karen, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure my audio will be bad, so I'll try and talk slow so that you can understand through the interruptions. Um, I'm glad that you have the background to make this uh, paper more intelligible. I, th I think I got the issue, um, and I'm I'm very intrigued by the notion that somehow this gives us new insight into the start of analytic philosophy. Um, I'm uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure that I understood that that point, but I was intrigued by it. Um, it seemed to me that well, one thing I did like about it is that he he does what I sometimes do, which is you know you take something something that's kind of complicated or um, where if you give it it's a sort of descriptive name it misleads people and you just call it by a by a by a name like Gertrude or Francis or something and so I liked you know I tend to do that and I like how he does that he says you know just call some property Kim right um, but I think my impression was that in order to be a reductionist about these relational properties you just allow into your ontology some pretty weird holes Right, some, I mean, and maybe it's not problematic because how hard is it to allow in, um, you know, relatively weird states of affairs or facts um, or objects. Um, but it, it, so it seems to me that you get, you get sort of parsimony in your um, truth makers in terms of, you know, you just have these, what is it, what does he call it? Mon monotonic um, Monatic. truth makers. Monatic. Yeah, yeah, not monotonic. Not monotonic. Um, yeah, monadic truth makers, <clears throat> but at the expense of having these potentially odd holes, right? Um, and holes meaning like entities composed of parts um, and being pretty generous with your mirrorology. 
So if he's right that this is something that the anti-reductionist is committed to anyway, being pretty generous with what you call a thing or an object or a state of affairs or facts, then maybe you know his, his argument is pretty convincing. But um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to working through this because I, I read it maybe a little bit too quickly to completely understand the, um, the argument, though I do think it, I get the general shape. Um, a couple of other uh, initial comments. Uh, the bit about essence and um, intrinsicality, uh, I think is an attempt to give one paragraph summation of another paper that he cites, one of his own. And I, I briefly mm -hmm. skimmed it. Uh, and um, I, I, I can say with some confidence that this is not something we're supposed to just have as general knowledge. It's just, you know, again, uh, what he argues elsewhere. And we can go there if it's interesting. And I think it might be. Uh, and secondly, um, this I also am interested motivates if we could, me. Yeah. If we can try and, and try and understand the distinction he's making between intrinsic and essential. Yeah, yeah, we should try. I mean, I think we might be able to without reading the other paper. But I just, this is just a warning that if it's at all mysterious, we should just expect to find it there and then not to be able, to, not necessarily to be able to figure it out. The other, it, the other bit I wanted to mention is, whereas I did very happily have the background for a lot of what was here, one bit that was missing and something I've been planning to learn is mirrorology. And he cites two classical sources, well, two sources for classical mirrorology. Uh, one of them is something by Peter Simons, somebody we've read. Uh, and the other is The Structure of Appearance by Goodman, which is a classic mm -hmm. work I never got around to. So um, those weren't even where I was going to go. I was going to go to parts of classes by Lewis, uh, but arguably those are maybe more appropriate. Uh, one, because they're mentioned here and Lewis is not. And second, and he would be because Lewis is prominent. And secondly, because they're prior. I, I think Lewis isn't from the 80s and these are from... Uh, well, they're earlier, I forget. Structural appearances from the 50s. The Simons, I think, was 82. So, you know, uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's it. Let's dive in. Where does it start? Oh, it's already on the right page. Okay, so one, two, 217. So what is this about? So first of all, um, this only really matters to people who care about truth makers, or at least uh, mostly. He does give us two other reasons why we might care. Namely, if you have other ideas about uh, ontology uh, that would not accommodate, as he puts it, accommodate irreducibly relational facts. And the other is just if you're interested in what Russell and Moore gave us their reasons to break with Hegel. Uh, he doesn't really expand on the third one. And the second one is a kind of just uh, weaker interest in the kinds of things that truth maker theorists are interested in without having to be properly interested in truth makers themselves. But since we are reading this as part of a truth maker series and the historical bit isn't especially expanded upon here, it really just comes down to what do the truth makers have to be? We've previously wrestled with uh, negations, uh, truths of modality, uh, those are the big ones, right? What else? What are, uh, disjunctions. Um, but but here uh, we deal with something that had never come up before, which it, which is uh, relations that aren't easily construed as uh, extrinsic, basically um, uh, properties masquerading as relations which ultimately are what Russell calls internal relations, relations that come down to just, you know, a few uh, properties, intrinsic properties. So a simple example is uh, something being bigger than something else. It's uh, a relation grammatically, but actually if you have the size of the one thing and you have the size of the other, effectively uh, you've reduced it down to non-relational properties. So the question is whether you can do this with all the relations or whether there are any relational facts that you can't reduce down to non-relational, or rather relational truths, propositions that are uh, relation, uh, 
prop uh, relational propositions that are true that are not made true by non-relational facts. Yeah. And uh, he gives as his first example of this, um, the uh, spatiotemporal relations. And I don't know if you wanna dwell any more on the initial pages, but I think we can jump to the Australia case. But, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's fine. I, I will say I read the first the first half of this paper with um, many drinks having been consumed, um, <laughs> and it, it definitely um, led me to have some some new thoughts that have stuck with me and are bothering me just from this oh. first two pages. Oh, let's have them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, in vino veritas, right? Is that the yeah, <laughs> exactly. In this case, it was uh, in uh, however you say uh, pina colada <laughs> <laughs> in Latin. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I've been on this 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 kick of sort of casting Gosh. off a lot of intuition. Pina colada, pina colada is already Latin. <laughs> is it is it Latin Latin? No. <laughs> Um, so if, if truth is a property of, of a sentence and we are concerned with relational facts like relative sizes, um, I, I kept thinking how it, it almost presupposes the, um, sort of, uh, epistemicizing truth because we're saying there's something about the world that makes the sentence true, but we're already including um sort of uh units of measurement which are clearly going to be epistemic and the the sort of objective reference frames aren't clear so if we're you know speaking about space time we might be able to speak about reference frames apart from any sort of unit of measurement but it gets sort of tricky and i think this trips a lot of scientifically minded people up when they come to study philosophy where they just sort of assume this epistemic reference frame that ep that reference frames are just epistemic in nature um, but then I found myself sort of considering that while reading this. So if we're considering relative properties like size, we're already comparing things that we have measured. <laughs> um, so then to look for properties in the world that make true the sentences that already presuppose a, a measurement or some sort of reference, um, I was wondering if that's already sort of smuggling in an epistemic account of truth. So... Uh no, 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 because no, because you because if something is bigger than something else, I mean, just to be crude about it, it it's it is bigger independently whether you measure it or not. First of all, and second, uh, though it might seem relational insofar as you say of one that it is two um, two meters long, the other one's one meter long, and that's in relation to the meter. Actually, uh, the longer one is 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 longer irrespective of the standard of measure that you use. It's, it's being longer is indifferent to how you measure or whether you measure. Right, but I mean, that's just, that's just bringing in the problem of universals and the problem of predication. I mean, that just is the problem of universals. So if something has the property of being a certain size or being bigger than, I mean, you have the problem of universals right there. So I guess I'm wondering how to tackle this issue without presupposing universals <laughs> well that's, that's that's what truth maker theory aims to do to to well, I'm not sure. yeah. well, well hold on hold on it, it aims to solve these problems with or without universals uh but owing owning up owning whatever resources have been employed but it's not epistemic either way uh, maybe it what? is interesting that the this paradigm example of something that doesn't have to be accounted for as a sort of purely relational fact, the, the you know, the size thing, I think intuitively I, I, I accepted the example, but it is kind of interesting that when we have epistemic access to that fact and we, we describe it with natural language, we, we, use, we use a relation, right? We compare it to a right. stick in Paris, right? The meter stick or, you know, that we, we do, we do use those relational paradigms to even in in these things that we think of well look it's you know if if you say this kid is taller than this kid this kid has his own height 
and that kid has their own height and you just say this height is greater than that height it doesn't you know it's i actually like the way he put it you know you don't need god to create a, a third thing which is the difference in their heights right, right. Uh, you know a relation between them. you just you get the one height you get the other height and that will make one taller than the other because there's more to this this kid than the other kid um height wise but you know when we when we do measure um things like heights and weights we do you know we just compare them to other things like our feet but that's what also, I'm you, also, also you shouldn't confuse their height with the number in the number that's that 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 represents the multiplier exactly. of some standard unit of measure it is simply the right. distance abstracted from whatever it is that is so distanced or extended no 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 so let me rephrase this so my concern isn't with whatever you know unitless absolute you know property of height one might have but but rather to say of one thing that it's larger taller heavier than another is almost to make a modal claim about what would be the case given some unit of measurement so they they have properties like of a certain height and it's not until they're compared that then this larger than heavier than relationship seems it seems to obtain like i think to look for this property in the world that would make these statements true is to suppose some sort of modal claim about what would be the case if they were compared and comparisons are always going to be some sort of process or uh, judgment or something like that right. it's just enough to bother me I, I can see there being some universal or property that stands as a truth maker but it seems to presuppose some sort of modal claim about comparison that is epi epistemic it just seems i wonder why you bring compare i wonder why you bring comparison into it at all anyway to say that something is larger than something else is not to say anything about what would happen but about what is but i guess i mean is 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 the thought about, that look what, there's what about the truth there, sorry Karen. there's no large what, what about this truth this is larger than that and would be whether or not it were ever measured how can that be about what would happen if it were measured right i guess i'm just wondering if the meaning of larger than presupposes measurement i'm not sure what it would mean like what would make that true in the world right like i mean that's the topic what makes larger than true <laughs> um right, and it's, right. it's like an okay. obvious maybe, maybe, your intuition, yeah. maybe your intuition yeah. is just that if unless unless we can provide a truth maker we have to fall back on a modal epistemic reading i can i can live with that well I, i'm wondering it could be modal and non-epistemic or it could be uh modal and epistemic they might come apart i guess that's what i'm wondering i'm, I'm wondering if there is some sort of non-epistemic modal account of these relational properties Maybe necessarily they have to be okay. non-modal comparison. That, that's really the, the, the point. I was just too quick. How about this? Unless we can find a truth maker, uh, whether it's reductive or non-reductive, then we have to fall back on an epistemic interpretation of compare of of um, of these kinds of relations. Is that fair? Right. I think that's fair. And even he even hints at Lewis, right? You might want to adopt a modal realism to get around some of these issues. And I, I kind of felt that pull. I thought, wait, actually, that that actually does, does speak. So what I have in mind is something like this to say that um, a window is is fragile. Like it, you, you have to account for this fragility property, right? When what you're really claiming is some sort of modal claim, like under certain circumstances, like a rock or, you know, or an earthquake or something, it would shatter. Mm -hmm. You're making a modal claim. But then you confuse the modal claim with a property that it has, right? You have to look for that frag fragility property. And that might be a, mis right. a mistaking of the property in the world with a modal claim about the world. But what we're really saying is if these conditions obtain, it would shatter. And that's what we're trying to cash out in terms of what would make true. And I'm wondering if that, 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 that's the same for just any relational properties, like bigger than, larger than, you know. Um, and and so that's just for the first couple of pages. I was like, ah, oh, shit. Like that's this is really tricky. <laughs> no, that, that's true. But in the fragility case, I really have the strong intuition that it precisely is the properties that make the modal claim true, the properties that it actually has. Yeah, you know, the actual structure of the atoms, which, which and not the and not the modal claim, which sort of is explaining an, a property that we're backwards attributing to the to the reality. I have the same intuition, I, but no, in, I'd go further. I'd that to, to, to say that nature is has a nomological structure is is to say that the dispositional properties must uh, be grounded in something non-dispositional. Otherwise, it would just be I don't even know what how would how I would make sense of those dispositions. 
grounded in something non what do you mean like the, the fact that something is fragile would have to be grounded in some prop some non-dispositional property of the thing that is fragile if we are to say that its fragility is lawful right so what about like a sheet of glass floating in a universe without larger objects like nothing could potentially shatter it and yet it has the same constitution as a sheet of glass in our universe it, does it have the property of fragility in that universe yes because in that universe if there were anything else in that universe that would come into contact in the right way it would shatter right yeah no, so that's hmm. i think it has our property of fragility but um uh like i could imagine a universe where you know, a glass is actually the least flat, fragile thing in the universe, in that particular universe, right? So it would be weird to highlight its fragility, right? And I can understand, I mean, I can think of situations even in this universe where something like a diamond is pretty fragile. You know, I guess it's heading towards a supernova or something. I don't know. I, don't, I mean, like maybe there are situations where it's, but um so maybe there is a sort of relative but given a context i think the fragility of the of the glass is we're attributing a property of the glass not just making claims about possible world space right. Especially so since I think we're, once you do a physics of fragility there's going to be some coefficient right it's fragile the fragility mm -hmm. of glass is going to be 0.3 that's whatever um and even if it's the least fragile thing it'll still be 0.3 But I think that's sort of the point here. There are going to be these intrinsic properties that then are going to need a reference frame or context in order to cash out modal claims. And, and truth makers for modal claims, very tricky. So we're already in the realm of, of wanting mm -hmm. to or have, being motivated to abandon truth makers to account for these dispositional properties or relational properties. No, I, I, I don't see why you would need a, a frame of reference to cash out the disposition. Um, like Karen just said, I mean, there's a universe where a diamond is the most fragile thing and a universe where a sheet of glass is the strongest thing. And it's all going to come down to some, some sort of context, some sort of yes, possible but, event. Yes, but being most fragile is not the same thing as being fragile. And, and being fragile might be uh, something that you can put on a, on a scale uh, so that diamond is actually the hardest uh, solid. But um, but that doesn't sound like some... I, I, if, <laughs> if you're putting out a scale, you already have this relational, um, you know, measurement or something. So it, it's yeah, but it's like, no, no, not, no, no, it's not. It's not it, it, no, just because it's going to be a scale, problem, no. yeah. Just because on a scale doesn't mean it's it's relational. Um, mass is on a scale, but it's not relational. So let's. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Yeah, we're asking all the right questions, but but I I, I think it needs yeah. to be a little more motivated. Possible worlds are weird too because, I mean, there are possible worlds where diamonds are the most fragile because they're there's everything that's in that universe is harder, and then there's possible worlds where diamonds are the least fragile because diamonds are like marshmallows in that world, right? I mean, because possible worlds are weird, right? So, yeah. But their uh, but their hardness is the same in both worlds. Uh, yeah, I don't know because you know the laws of physics can change in possible worlds. I'm not sure. Oh no, I was holding those constant. I, I was only... how far out you get in the possible world space. Yeah, if the I was, I was the same. Yeah, I was holding the yeah, laws constant. Yeah. And so that's what. I, yeah. So the, I mean, if we're if we're trying to do work with modal modal truths, we have to draw lines in the possible world space anyway. And it seems like right. a lot of our intuitions about drawing those lines will come from intuitions about real world properties. So um, right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so let's just take the Australia case. I mean, I think this will, I think it's a very good example and I think it will settle it. Um, oh, can I just highlight mm -hmm. that on, because it's on page 218, the second page, there was, I think a very brief one second sentence reply to Horwich. Um, nor should facts in this sense be regarded as true propositions for unless some extreme linguistic idealism is true, synthetic propositions do not make themselves true. Yes. 
Um, so I, I think, but I'm, I'm not sure I can unpack that, but I was just highlighting, I was like, I think this is his response, would be his response to the paper we just read. Oh, yeah. Right, because this is where we say facts are basically true. Yeah, but, but, I mean, but I think Corwich is kind of a yeah. linguistic yeah. idealist. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe he would reject that. And that maybe, would, maybe, maybe that would make maybe it dispute more interesting. But I, that's right, definitely says, the like, impression I got. Guilty as charged. That. Yeah, that's definitely the impression I got from reading Horwich. <laughs> I, I, and I might have jumped to say so, but ah, I was just upset. Okay, um, okay so. Um, yeah, first of all, actually, before we go to uh, section two, I, I was. Um, I was very concerned with uh, the way he tries to characterize the making true. And this is that paragraph, I think, that makes reference to the other paper at, at, at the top of um, 219. He says, making true is a more contentious concept to pin down. I have argued elsewhere that X makes P true if X is intrinsically such that P uh, to put this another way, a duplicate of X cannot exist without P being true. And yet a third way, P cannot become false without a non-Cambridge change in X. I, I was uncomfortable with this. Um, let me just get to the end and we can discuss. Many truth maker theorists hold, however, that a river fact essentially makes true on only those truths that it makes true. A doctrine I call truth maker essentialism. This leads them to define making true, thus X makes P true, if only if X is essentially such that P, or to put this another way, a counterpart of X cannot exist without P being true. And yet a third way, P cannot become false without the destruction of X. Okay, so um, this is the language of intrinsicality. You got duplicates, uh, you got essential, well, he says, he, uses, he says intrinsic. Cambridge change is also part of the intrinsicality uh, discourse. I don't see that intrinsicality came up in any way of putting things in any of the papers we've read so far. Uh, my immediate response to this was that the necessitarian axiom, the idea that the truth maker relation is necessarily, is necessary, is, is, has nothing to do with the necessity of the proposition made true. You can, make a contingent proposition true and the truth maker relation would remain necessary. But then if, if I'm right about that, then it seems to me that a duplicate can fail to make uh, a proposition true um, if the proposition has some uh, necessary connection, causal connection to the truth maker. And I have this in mind specifically for indexicals, which comes up later when he brings up hexaity, except he brings it up in a way that struck me as very different from the way I think about it. And I think a lot will turn on this issue. I didn't have much to say, much more to say than just those intuitions on this paragraph, but I would like to expand on it, but only in relation to what he says about hexaity. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, let's just, just consider an example. Um, you know, if, if, if we say the cat is on the map uh, and there's a duplicate of the entire house, you know, one town over, it's just not the cat I'm talking about. You know, I mean, the context the context is going to make the proposition uh, otherwise expressible as this cat is on this mat, right? But then how are you supposed to identify the truth maker of such a proposition in such a way that the duplicates of, of that cat and that mat could possibly make the proposition true? I think there are deeper issues here 
Yeah. I'm, and, issue, and, and questions I haven't really explored very much, which yeah. is exactly how, what, what can you do to get rid of indexicals in, 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 in deriving a canonical form for a preposition? And I've, I used to think that you can always get rid of them. And then after reading, what's his name? At Stanford, the essential index school. Maybe, yeah, I, I think about? here, I think here duplicate, maybe it's, 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 it's some sort of term of art that he's introducing and that he would set out in his paper to be contrasted with counterpart, which he uses when he's defining essentialism, which is the contrasting view. And yes, no, so yes, maybe yes. duplicate is 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 a is a counterpart, but without that problem, that counterparts aren't really you. Yes, the, right? I, actually, it's it's actually so maybe technical. duplicate is meant to preserve the indexical, so it is no. the same cat. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, I doubt that, but you might be right. But because just, how could it be different than you know? Yeah. So duplicate, uh, duplicate. I I took to be in the same world. Whereas counterpart is uh, not. Basically, a counterpart is a um, duplicate or near duplicate at some other possible world to be identified with um, with what it is a counterpart for. Although, to be honest, that's only how Lewis uses counterpart. Those who oppose Lewisian counterpart theory might have some other use for the word counterpart, but I've never actually seen it used by anybody else. Whereas duplicate, the word duplicate is used all the time by various people in talking about intrinsicality. Right. And, and it's it's never about modality, it's just about um, copies, you know, perfect copies in actuality. So I don't see how I could preserve, I mean, the whole point of duplicates is to preserve all the qualities, but not the hexaity. And I thought index goals picked out hexaity, if anything. Yeah, that's why I'm thinking maybe he's using it as some sort of term of art so that it that it it does preserve the uh, you might be right. Hexaity, I mean, but I'm quite sure that the answer that, is in I mean, the other paper have, I mentioned. Right, yeah, exactly. Um, right. Um, and also X here is presumably a fact rather than so what what's a duplicate fact that's interesting right because he, he's it's sort of he talks about um truth makers or facts whatever those are right so they're not true propositions but he doesn't he, you know, he says i'll leave it open to your variety of truth maker theories about what a fact is so if it if it's um if x makes p true then X is a fact and P is a proposition. So we're talking about duplicate facts. So um, it seems to me that a cat in a different house on a different mat is a different fact. So, so you know, so what is a duplicate fact? And is it a counterpart fact, but but one that is retains the hexaides? So I think that but then that's, that's a weird I, thing. I think that's what you mean. Yeah. That's what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, I, I, I'm not prepared to admit that that shows that it preserves sexuality, but, but it's it's definitely something that needs to be addressed, and I didn't address it. Maybe the way to address it is to say that the proposition "the cat is on the mat" is just one of those relational propositions, and and for that reason. Uh, the duplicate has to include what it relates to, and it could be the speaker. Right. You know, so the duplicate of the cat and the mat and the house in which it's in has to include the person saying this, but then it would be true. Right. I mean, even if it's not something not relational, right? If 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 height is his paradigm of something that's not relational, all those considerations about the meters to compare us aside. If the fact that I'm five foot seven and three quarters makes the same the sentence Karen is five foot seven and three quarters true, um, does that mean a duplicate of Karen? 
cannot exist without Karen being five foot seven and three quarters being true. Well, if Karen refers the same, you know, if for, for that to work through, you have to solve this problem about what is the duplicate Karen, because otherwise it's a different proposition, right? So we're going to have to work this out that the that she put about, about the relationship between duplicates and the propositions that we're talking about those duplicates. Right. Right. Even if it's not a relational one, right? Because who's high, who, whose height are we talking about? My duplicate will have the same height because they're my duplicate. But then the proposition should be Karen's duplicate has, right? So, so unless the reference of Karen goes through for any even non-relational facts, you're going to have this issue. What do you mean by duplicate, right? Right. And 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 does is does is P adjusted accordingly so that it refers to the duplicate and not the original? Yeah, I mean, I I I don't really have a strong opinion about what he really means. Uh, I think you give a good counter perspective to the one that I had, and I'd rather just read that other paper. But let's 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 talk about Australia. Um, <laughs> okay, so he says. At the top of uh, 220, um, you could know all the monadic facts about Sydney and all the monadic facts about Canberra, uh, and thus the monadic conjunctive facts about Canberra and Sydney, without knowing that Canberra is south of Sydney. God could create each city, filling each with the requisite number of persons, cafes, and so on. And so I, I like that he recognizes that the essential facts about cities are the persons in the cafes. That I very much approve of. Uh, <laughs> and so on until every monad. <laughs> you duplicate those. I mean, that's, that's what matters, you know. The, the bank branches are not that important. Listen, yeah, he's got his priorities well in order. Uh, and, and so on until every monadic fact concerning Sydney and Canberra was made true, but he would still not have brought it about that Canberra is south of Sydney. Well, um, he goes on to do a little history reminding us of Leibniz's anti-relationalism and more recently Keith Campbell's similar views uh, but what it comes down to is how we think about space and time with respect to truth makers and, uh, and also how we relate, how we think about space and time to how we think about mirrorological fusions. Is there something more to Sydney and Canberra than the mirrorological fusion between them? And, uh, or actually, maybe we can begin by asking. I mean, he doesn't go into it. He cites a few things, but we haven't, I don't think, we haven't collectively read enough on this to have anything to draw upon other than our own preferences or our um, preferences before reading further. Uh, but the question is raised as, whether there are any restrictions on what would qualify as a mirrorological fusion. Could you take the fusion of Sydney and Canberra without regard to anything other than that they are two parts that could make up a whole? Clearly, if it were nothing more than that, then there would be a symmetry to the fusion such that that symmetry could not be uh, a truth maker, sorry, such that that symmetric fusion could not be a truth maker for something like south of, because south of is asymmetric. This is the uh, argument given by the anti reductionists, including Russell. Right. Uh, do you have any thoughts before I offer mine? Many. <laughs> I'll just give you mine. Jump in. Uh, it seems to me that uh, 
that there's perfect that there's nothing wrong with a plain mirological fusion between Sidney and Canberra, but that Australia is not that fusion. Australia is a special spatiotemporal fusion, and that spatiotemporal fusion is not symmetric. And that's it. I don't know how closely that tracks his particular answer, which seemed more subtle than what I have just given. I don't think I've said anything especially holistic, let alone Hegelian, uh, but it strikes me that, uh, that uh, space is, is not just a conceptual scheme of measurement, it's a physical entity in itself and as such has parts arranged in very specific ways, namely the Australian way. And that any other way of arranging it would be a fusion, that's true, but not the one that is relevant for relations such as being south of. Right. More broadly and more specifically, yeah. I could say, uh, there is a single physical actual whole uh, that relies on more than mere mirological fusion for its constitution. And that I think addresses these concerns. Yeah. I mean, I... Yeah, do they have to be a part of that whole because it's interesting because I thought, oh, this is an interesting example, right? Because the first one he gives us is of the, you know, he, he has that lovely thing. He quotes Keith Campbell saying, um, you know, the in, in the intuitive picture of divine creation, if God makes an island A with so much rock, soil, et cetera, as to amount to 20 hectares, and subsequently an island B of 15 hectares extant, there's nothing more needing to be done to make A larger than B, right? Whereas if you want to put that, you want to make that island south of the other one, you're going to have to do something else, right? God has another thing to do. But I'm, but it wasn't clear to me that he does something that's sort of inherently relational rather than make a third thing, right? A globe to put the islands on that has poles. So maybe more than one thing, right? Um, I would just, I would just remove the globe. Like it, creating space in a, in a very realistic sense of space is another entity in itself. You don't need a planet. Right. And then he says, so that's why, um, was it Lewis? Who, no, wait, who, or Armstrong, who he says, argues that there's a, you know, that there's this, a space, space time relations that are this thing. Um, Oh, I, I can find it. But, is it a, um, a Timothy Sprigg, the holistic relations to that? Maybe. On uh, 221, the very top. Let's see. Yes. Or holistic, maybe, yeah, maybe that's the thing. Um. So when, when he, yes, yeah, so when he brings in Australia, I mean, he does sort of introduce it as a kind of a whole of which Canberra and Sydney are parts, but I don't know if it's just a third thing that they have a relationship with. Right. I think it is a third. I mean, I guess it's the anti, the anti reductionist wants to just say, well, look, there's a relation there and the relation has structure, asymmetric structure, rather than appeal to a third thing, which is some sort of encompassing whole that the things are part of. That's right. The anti-reductionist wants to say that there's, um, how did you put it? A third thing? That there's, that there's a, a sort of structure in the relation. So if you take it's yeah, a third so entity, rather than there being a third which is thing. The real, yeah, third there's, entity. There's a third entity, but it's not a thing, right? It's like it's like it's a universal, a relation, but without 
um, there being some corresponding object that could be a relatum to some monadic property. Like Australia is a country, okay? Um, and country is a one place predicate, is a country, is a one place yeah. predicate. And it is in virtue of there being something that makes that predicate, that satisfies that predicate, that we can then say, because that thing, Australia, has parts, that one part is south of another part. Whereas the anti reductionist says, no, you don't need an Australia. You just need there to be a state of affairs or some kind of relation, some non thing, and yet a truth maker. Um, right. That like makes a structured that, relationship. Some state of affairs, whatever that means. Right. So I feel very reductionist myself in this. And by the way, Josh, you were relating this to reductionism in the broader context of including including like a mind world reductionism. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's appropriate or not. It might be. Um, so, but, but, but I'm not sure. So when I say I'm a reductionist here, um, consider it a coincidence that I'm a reductionist in the other sphere as well. So what I have in mind with that is if, if um, mental so causation if there's... just is physical causation, of course, you'd want to reduce the mental to the physical and just say that's, you know, that's all there is. But if, if there is something about the arrangement of, let's say, disparate physical states that we can refer to as a type, and we call that the mental, and that it has a certain causal power and virtue of that configuration, you can't really reduce it without losing some sort of causal explanatory power. Similarly with um, Australia, if you have to sort of, you can't go into the parts, but you have to go out to the whole to account for the relational structure then you're going to lose something in reducing to the parts. You have to then introduce some third thing like a relational property or something. But for the anti-reductionist, they might wanna say, no, you have to consider the whole to even get that structured information, that structured relationship. And it seems to me that's, that's going to motivate, similarly for mental causation or mental states, what you would want from um, spatial relations as well. You need an Australia or some larger region in the parts to account for the the relationship between the two cities in the region, right? So it seems to me it's it's the exact yeah, same strategy. It's, right? Well, it's very interesting that he sort of throws in causation as a, as a, another at one point as another example of something the anti-reductionists might say is a is one of these cases where there's um, an irreducible relation, right? Because it's asymmet asymmet asymmetric, right? The um, the the baseball causes the window to shatter. Um, so there's an asymmetry there, um, but in that case, what is the third that we go to, right? It's one thing to say, um, and let's, say, let's take something where they're not in the same country. So it's, it's harder to say, if you say, for example, that London is north of Montreal, which I was always surprised that it was. <laughs> when I lived in Montreal and it was so cold and I'd go to London to visit family and it'd be so much warmer. But anyway, um, so yeah, London is north of Montreal. Um, and you say, well, that, that makes sense because there's this third thing, which is what? The Northern hemisphere or um, that makes that true. An earth. But what did the case about an earth? Yeah. So what, what is the, what about, um, the baseball shatters the window. Um, if that's supposed to be one of those cases where there's an asymmetry there that can't just be captured, and there's the truth maker that is the window shattering. And um, what's the third thing that accounts for the relation in the case of causation? Well, there's there's the history of um, there's two things there's there's the history Time. of no uh, when we speak of the window and the the baseball was it uh, mm -hmm. we're 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 talking about uh, continuance 
so so each of these objects has histories there's the window before chatters and the window after chatters the ball when it was here and then when it was there and then we have the spatial relations between the window and the baseball and then we're back to the same question as with australia which is uh, what does it mean to say that the baseball went through this window and not some other window? Well, it's that they're both well, parts of a larger whole, which is uh, the no, wall window. I, I think for the case of causation, the third thing has to be a law or something like that, right? Or something like necessitation or some particular yeah, sure. cover law. Would be but yeah, that, that too. And I, and I think that just includes more and more of the world. Um, no, because I think in the right, case of uh, geography or, you know, the globe, you, you need space. And so you need something like, um, it wouldn't be a law, it would, it would just be something like, um, well, just whatever the relation of <laughs> distance or some sort of spatial relation. So no, that would be I the think, third. I think space is what it is in virtue of certain laws. So, so to go back to the, the divine God example, we, I mean, we understood if God makes one island with this amount of hectares and then makes another island with less hectares he doesn't have to create or do any there's nothing else that needs to be put into the world for it to be the fact that one island is larger than the other right. so god creates um this you know chunk of matter baseball and this window and there is it the case that nothing has to be put into the world to make it the case that the baseball broke the window. Well, you can just talk yeah. about the window and talk about the baseball. And are you suggesting that, well, what God would do is create the whole history of the baseball and the history of the window. And so the causation doesn't need to be some sort of special asymmetric. Um, in fact, in fact, God could create, could create the, the windows history first and the baseball only, only, later and it would still be the baseball that caused the window to shatter. Uh, I'm not sure about the timeline here um, or how you can create histories out of order with the history itself. Um, let me go back to well, the hectares. To... Yeah. Yeah. It's, okay. I think that if you create one island with 15 hectares, then before you can begin to create the second island, you've already created a world uh, in which there is uh, space uh, and and it is in that world that you create the second island on pains of not being able to say that the second one is 20 hectares. To, to, to say that one is larger than the other is to say that they are part of the same world and you only create the world as a whole as a single event. So it seems that it's deceptively uh, non-relational, but remains relational in the same way as when we say that one is south of the other. It's just a little less asymmetric. Oh, so we should be anti-reductionist about everything. Well, um, because let, what's the- I might go too I far. Mean, we, we introduced, we introduced, Australia to solve the Canberra problem, but then how do we explain the relationship between Sydney and Australia and Canberra and Australia such that we can explain the relationship between Australia and Sydney, I mean Canberra and Sydney appealing to Australia. Well, here you just have plain neurology. Uh, Sydney's part of Australia. You don't really create Australia without creating Sydney. But it's a specific location in Australia, right? A specific part of Australia. So mm -hmm. you have to, um, and do we understand like structured parts without understanding relations that are not reducible to uh, just descriptions of holes now independent just, of their parts? Again, I'm, I'm just not really sure what it means to say that they're not reducible. And I think the hexaity issue is what all of this turns on, because I can, I can certainly understand how um, you could create a Sydney duplicate on the Western side of Australia. Mm -hmm. And why should we say that it isn't Sydney? 
created twice. I, I, I think we have to test various ideas about X80 uh, to, to make that judgment. And I'm not sure exactly where I would land or, I mean, I, I know what I think, I'm just not sure how to talk about it um, in, in, with this discourse. If, if there were a duplicate of Sydney on the Western coast, I don't think I would call it Sydney. I'd call it a Sydney clone. Um, so Sydney would still be south of Canberra or whichever it is. I don't know enough about Australia. Is it north or south? I think it's south, Sydney. South okay, Canberra. so, so if, if, if you had a, a duplicate of Sydney north of Canberra, um, then that would be the Sydney clone. The Sydney itself would be the one that is in the actual location. But does that violate the premise that truth makers uh, have to that duplicates of truth makers have to make the same truths true? That doesn't seem right to me. Mm. You know, if I say I live in Sydney, um, that can't be made true by a duplicate of Sydney. My clone lives in my being Sydney clone, but not me. What any of this has to do with holism or Hegel or idealism? is deeply mysterious to me. I, I've been trained by Fodor to believe I'm against holism and trained by Quine to believe that I'm for it, which means I don't know what I think because I like them both. My, my current theory is that I'm mm. a confirmational holist but a semantic anti-holist. And this doesn't seem to be about confirmation, that is epistemology, or semantics, but about truth makers, metaphysics, which I, I guess would be closer to semantics than epistemology. Um, but I don't think that's what Fodor was talking about. I think he was talking about things like concepts, not, um, not truth relations. So, so maybe when it comes to truth makers, I'm holist. Can I be a holist and a reductionist at the same time, as long as I qualified appropriately? Confirmation holist, semantic reductionist, <laughs> make a whole list. I mean, can I do that? I'm not even sure about confirmation. Yeah. I think I, I, I lean toward thinking confirmation should be reductionist after all, although I'm very, very sympathetic to the point of preferring to argue for uh, Quine style confirmational holism. I think that ultimately, if you're careful about your semantic reductionism, then you can retain all the lessons of uh, of a, of a post-positivist empiricism and give up the holism there too. So I'm, I'm, I'm just, I just, I don't like, what I don't like about holism is that is this, this idea that everything depends on everything else. But it doesn't seem to me that I'm admitting to that just because I admit that whether Canberra is so south or north of Sydney depends on Australia. That doesn't seem radical to me. That just seems like a recognition that sometimes the relevant truth maker is big. Sometimes it's the whole universe. That should not be surprising. But isn't this more about intrinsicality versus essentialism though? According to him it is, but I don't see that yet, remember. But I, I do because if we're saying that, you know, essential to being Sydney is some uh, property of locality, then you're sort of, I don't know if that's question begging because then oh, you're I don't think of... it is. I don't think it is. I don't think uh, Sydney's locality is essential to Sydney. Okay, but I thought you said if it were duplicated and, and moved, it, it wouldn't be. But just because the, the well, that doesn't mean Sydney what? couldn't be somewhere other than where it is. All I'm saying is that in it, so it's <laughs> good questions. <laughs> Let me give you tentative and very poorly supported answers. Um, so <laughs> these are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> if if Sydney had a clone, okay, and that clone were in California, yeah, 
that would not be Sydney. However, if the world were such that Sydney, the movie where the Matrix was filmed, isn't that right? Is that where they filmed it? I have no idea. I think they used Sydney. Let's just okay. say. Okay. So um, not not the second two. I think they used a bit of LA in that. But um, <laughs> but if if the first Matrix was you know, like like I don't mean like the studio recordings, but but the buildings, uh, the the cityscape, yeah. I think that was Sydney skyline. If they used Sydney. Um, so, sorry, if, if that's the Sydney we're talking about and that were in California so that the Matrix movies were actually shot in California, right? And Australia had no duplicate. It only had Canberra and uh, Melbourne. Then Sydney would have been in California. So uh, what is or isn't essential is very relative to um, pragmatics uh, of discourse, which are set by the actual hypothetical in this but case. But it sounds like the only, the only thing you're calling essential is history then, right? Uh, I'm not sure I'm admitting anything is essential right now. I think uh, essential, first of all, I take essence to be uh, a species of modality, right? It's, 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 it's kind of like necessity. It's not exactly the same thing, but, it, but it's um, perhaps interdefinable with necessity, perhaps although I'm aware that there are problems with that. I take necessity to be just a matter of, uh, of holding some kinds of facts fixed and others not fixed as you consider possibilities. Typically, uh, uh, um, logical truths and truths of the laws of nature, typically, right? But, but you, could, you could do other kinds of modality. So um, is a city's location essential to it? Well, it's certainly not given by its logic and it's not given by the laws of nature, but it might be given by its history. So you can give some hypotheticals where you hold its location to be essential and other hypotheticals where you don't. Kind of factuals, I mean, not hypotheticals. Right, okay. Um, but does Sydney have any intrinsic properties? Obviously it would, right? When it, uh, it um, maybe it's not essential, but locality would be an intrinsic property of Sydney. Like I said, it depends on the counterfactual under consideration. Uh, for any property that I might take as intrinsic for some counterfactual, there will be other counterfactuals for which I would not take it to be intrinsic. So I, I, I guess I'm a relativist about uh, intrinsic. Does it have to? Does it have to do with counterfactuals or just as a contrast with extrinsic? Well, it's the same thing. It's just like, it's just where you draw the line between the intrinsic and extrinsic. Um, mm. Yeah. I mean, this is tricky because if a city has um, a surface area, I guess, then it has something like spatiality as it, possibly an essential property, but also an intrinsic property. Um, and if it has any sort of spatiality to it, then it's placed, it has some point of existence, and then you're already off and running with, you know, needing to have something like a continent, a planet, a universe or something. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how to escape that. I mean, well, I do. I mean, I can tell you. Um, so, uh, well, first of all, there's two different kinds of uh, essential properties to cities you've mentioned. One is uh, having spatial extension, the other one is having a specific location, right? So with respect to having a specific location, I'm sure you'll agree that cities might have been located other than where they were, especially since they can be conceived of before you break ground. Uh, you might, for, you can imagine colonists in England uh, planning to have a, uh, a Williamsburg named after William, <laughs> not having picked the location yet. Okay, there you go. Uh, right. the but, I mean, that, that, that's just to make a distinction between essential and intrinsic. So if extension oh, is... Oh, I don't. I, I, I think, I think um, well, actually... In know, other words, to have extension is to to have the intrinsic property of being, you know, placed somewhere, to have locality, but not to have a particular locality. So a particular place isn't essential, but locality, having any location is intrinsic and possibly essential, right? 
you, you can't have extension without being somewhere. Of course not. Um, look, I, I right now I don't remember how to distinguish intrinsic and essential. I, I can recover it if I think about it because one of, I think I think intrinsicality is basically essence with respect to relations. I think I just forgot um, the the rough and ready. Uh, uh, way to understand intrinsicality is precisely in terms of duplicates. So um, what's intrinsic to something is whatever would survive a duplicate, a duplication, right? Um, but that's just the distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic, not intrinsic and essential, yeah. right? Yeah, no, of course, yeah, right. Um, so, so we might say that um, having content according to the swamp man theories is is not intrinsic because the swamp man doesn't have content assuming you take that view right, right, right. obviously that's a question uh, but um now i'm not prepared to speak to this i just I haven't really thought about it recently so you it might be, there might be something that separates intrinsicality from essence uh for the purposes of understanding what this is all about but i'm just I'm just not immediately feeling the pull of acknowledging that anything's intrinsic uh, to the purpose of uh, of identifying irreducibly relational facts. When I would say intuitively intrinsic is just contrasted with extrinsic so that say san francisco is intrinsically 49 square miles ish and extrinsically the second most populous city in the bay area um but it's not essentially 49 square miles because with global warming the ocean's rising it's not going to be yeah, that sounds right. Right. eventually no, that sounds right. eventually it'll be 36 square miles or something sad we'll lose the financial district back to the ocean that it from once we took it no you're um, right that that does sound right uh, intrinsicality so, i guess you know, has less to do with modality and more to do with uh not being uh relational at bottom yeah yeah okay so then well, yeah all you all you have to do is sort of create the properties that it has and nothing else as they say Right, right. So, so Sydney is not intrinsically part of Australia, uh, but um, wait, no, no, because it could be relocated and still retain all of its intrinsic properties. Okay, maybe I'm I'm not tracking this. So, I, I thought essential was contrast. No, yeah, go ahead. What it was essentially um, necessary versus contingent. And intrinsic is just contrasted with extrinsic. So um, Sydney is an intrinsic part of Australia, but it's not an essential part. Well, um, it is intrinsic to Australia that Sydney is part of it, but it is not intrinsic to Sydney. Sydney it's that it's in Australia. Australia. Yeah. Right. Um, or because at least. You, yeah, because if you duplicate Australia, you're going to take Sydney with you. But if you well, duplicate <laughs> Sydney, you don't take Australia. Right, unless it's, what if, being, what if, unless it's being Sydney is is an essential property is being in Australia. <laughs> yeah, but, right? but that but that's a separate consideration. Obviously, well, if it's essential to Sydney that it is Australian, it would be intrinsic as well. But I, I think actually, that's, that's not obvious. But no, maybe not. Know. Maybe not. I don't know. Like it might be essential to me that I have the parents that I have of certain genetic theories are right about right rigid designation but it's not intrinsic maybe i don't know maybe i don't know i mean yeah. they clearly come apart but but i guess i'm trying to get at why this to parsons is a, an important distinction for the truth making relationship and and how that reflects on this reduction anti-reduction of, of truth makers because it seems important for him and i'm not quite grasping it you want to just read the other paper i mean i, I think yeah just, I, yeah it just feels like a second part to the same paper uh, or maybe it's the first part. Maybe this is the second part. <laughs> yeah. I think we should just read the other paper. Maybe this is this is not really helping. Uh, but what do you think about Australia? Do, do you do you think that um, 
I'd like to go. I haven't been. That's what I think. It's just like California, but really far away. I don't know that it's worth <laughs> it. <laughs> uh, okay. You think that, uh, um, what's the question here? Oh yeah. Do, do you think that, um, that Sydney's being south of Canberra isn't made true uh, well, you'll agree that it's made true by Australia. Uh, well, because of the mono, was it the monotonicity pr principle or parts? Yeah. Make, yeah, in virtue of that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. Monistic. Mono, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> but it, but can Monadic. It be, okay, maybe, maybe, the, maybe this, this doesn't come from persons. I just thought of this, but maybe this is a way to ask the question. Could it be made true by anything other than Australia? I don't think so. That's my view. Um, I think Armstrong might say that there's a state of affairs that makes it true that Sydney is south of Canberra, independently of it being so in virtue of there being in Australia. I said Australia, I meant Canberra, uh, being part of Australia in the way that Australia. they are. Whereas, it, like, I, I don't think it's just about Sydney and Canberra. I don't think that's what makes one south of the other. What makes one south of the other is Australia. Is it that there's there's some larger hole that makes true the relations between the parts necessarily? Like there has to be some hole. So even if you were to take two cities from different continents, there would have to be some larger conglomerate consideration. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. Even, but, but to, it, even if you go to the Milky Way or the local group or whatever. Right. But but it's not like a myriological fusion that makes it true. It, it's some no. spatial region that makes it true. It's a spatiotemporal physical fusion, not a myriological fusion. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. But, but but that allows you to retain, I mean, information, right? I mean, that's kind of, I guess, Russell's problem with the myriological account he gave, you're sort of losing the relational information. But with the, the spatial region, you're maintaining that, you're, re you're retaining it. Well, I, f I found the... Um, that feels like cheating, though, because you're, sort of, you're sort of smuggling in the relation that you're trying to uh, establish, right? I'm not smuggling it in. I'm saying that's where it's located. I mean, look, if you if you don't bring in Australia, you don't get the relation. That's my view. That's yeah. Well, right. But you're looking for a fact that makes true. You're looking for a fact. That's just where it is. <laughs> but this is the metaphysical project of picking out the facts in the world that are truth makers. So if you're just saying the world makes true, um, I mean, it's. I guess I'm wondering why you would stop there. So th that's the monotonicity principle. I think ultimately you would also say that the world makes true. I think, the world, I think the actual world as a whole makes all the contingent truths true. Yeah. There's just one truth maker. Okay. But we're also interested in minimal truth makers, which is what makes all of this interesting. And the reason we're interested in is because ultimately we're going to be interested in modality. But, but, um, so we don't even need all of Australia. We just need the section of Australia that's between Sydney and Canberra. Exactly. Of course. Yeah. But sure. But just give that a name. Yeah, but then I guess it's its position on to. My point is, well, it's not a state of affairs. Globe. We need it's, whatever. It, don't, it's not do a state of affairs. It's a physical south? region of space. I was going to say you need enough to get directionality, like up and down. <laughs> right. No, need, no, no, no. You need no, to get no, a no. south, right? So you need a yeah. pull. I mean, if uh, if we're talking about like what God needs to create in order to get this relation into the world. Because, I mean, if he looks at, this is what I was trying to find earlier when I was talking about the, the person who kind of thinks of there being this reference of, fixed reference of space-time. Um, and it's Campbell, apparently. Uh, Leibniz, and most recently Campbell. Um, Campbell's approach requires that space-time is both real and absolute, right? So if you can imagine that, you know, God creates this island and it's this size and God creates this island and it's this size, and so even it just in doing that and nothing more, he's made one larger than the other. But then as soon as God just takes the islands and puts them like in this relationship in space time, one south of the other, and you don't need anything else. If there's a fixed grid of space time, right. That somehow will give sense to one being south of the other that will give structure right to the relationship. Right. So, you know, like if you've got Boris and his mat, where's Boris and his mat. Okay. You know, you, God creates a mat. God creates Boris. That's enough to make the mat taller than Boris. All God has to do is 
and Boris is on the mat, right? Um, Because there's some sort of reference in space time that makes this above and this below <laughs> somehow, right? So you you just need that that space time reference, and God all us all God has to do is this, and you've got on the mat. Um, so you know you could get Sydney time. and Canberra in this like nothing but the grid of space, but but then yeah, to be <laughs> south specifically, right? You think you think you need a pole? <laughs> you need a sure. north one and a south one. I was gonna say, sure. there's always the, there's always the trick that if you on, on a globe, if you walk north, you get to whatever south, right? So, right. Well, no, this is like, also make sure that that you might that need an mat, equator. Or... Isn't no, the no, map that... also on Boris? I mean, without a reference frame, like, doesn't it make true both? But they would it's, seem it's, to be three propositions. But the poles, the poles don't have to be given by the globe. Like, you could just uh, organize Sydney uh, on a, a contingent map, right? You could just have a, a city layout and say. Like let, let's say the streets in Sydney are numbered zero to a hundred and A to Z, right? You could just say that um, Canberra is in the direction of the A's, you know? So if you just walk from right. Z to but, A I mean, and then keep going, you get to Canberra. That's irrelevant. Uh, it, it leaves irrelevant where the poles are, whether there's a globe. It's just a matter of what happens when you extend space beyond the boundaries of the city. But if we're talking about like the minimal truth maker for what makes it true in this world, that Sydney is south of Canberra, then you think yeah. our poles are involved, right? Like to make it actually true in this world. Yes, I think you're right. It has to do with- Of course. Our globe, that, our poles. Yes, but, but I don't think it's- I don't think, I just don't think it's important to the case because all we need is an asymmetric spatio-temporal relation. And surely we can come up with our own asymmetric spatio-temporal relation that doesn't involve the North Pole. So I'm just proposing one now. Do we end up with an asymmetrical relation or do we just end up with some sort of three-part relation? Could, here's, here's, here's an asymmetric spatio-temporal relation that doesn't refer to the poles or the globe. Or Australia, you could just say um, Canberra's city hall. Sorry, no, Sydney's city hall is closer to Canberra than the Sydney Opera House. Okay, that's that's a. Um, it's a really big Sydney. Oh, closer to Canberra than okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Then, then the Sydney Opera House is closer to Canberra. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Right. <laughs> the city Hall is way up there in the suburbs of Canberra, but the Opera House is down by the harbor. Yeah, this okay. reminds me of something else we read. I don't know if uh, there was the counterfactual. Could, you couldn't be in both New York and Chicago at the same time, unless, of course, you moved to Chicago to New York and you're on the bridge with one leg on each, or you get really mm -hmm. big, you know? So, <laughs> so yeah, you could do crazy. No, I, I just meant um, that you can basically speak of the orientation of the city relative to another city. And that's effectively the same thing as an asymmetric relation between cities. There sounds like a regress hiding in here. So yeah, it's called Bradley's regress. Yeah, exactly. I so, think if you need a third, you need you need a fourth thing. So you need something like um, some sort of regional consideration, some sort of like larger region, and then you need some sort of comparison of that to determine some sort of orientation. You really need four things. I think that's going to lead to five things and six things. Yeah. Take, take us there. Take us there. I don't see it. But I'm pretty sure you're talking about Bradley's regress because I don't see Bradley's regress either. Oh, oh, really? I did once, but... Now I seem to refuse to. I don't know. <laughs> even yeah. uh, even related to well, I mean, do you mean metaphysically or even with predication, or do you not see them, see them as distinct? I, I think they're the same thing, and I don't think I see either. Okay, so I think Bradley's is specifically with with the application of universals um, for predication. So it's slightly. Oh, I think distinct. I think it applies here. I think the the historical yeah. bit about Russell rejecting Hegel is really about rejecting Bradley. Yeah, Bradley well, he argued against Bradley. Bradley. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, well, the the um, the orientation aspect that that Karen was getting into seems to be the problem. So you're going to have some larger region that encompasses two parts, 
and to need to determine some sort of orientation. So then you're going to have to compare that region to like another region and say, you know, part A is above part B within this larger region relative to region, this other region, right? It's to something like that, right? But then you're going to have to zoom out and create a region that encompasses both of the large regions to say something about that, which you're going to need to have another region to introduce some sort of directionality within that larger region. And I think that's that's going to be this this region. No, the, okay. The reason you don't need to do that is because um, the third region, let's call it Australia, yeah. uh, has the first two regions, Sydney and Canberra, as parts. Yes, but so you're not you you're not so going to get above. Need, or, you don't, you don't get above even, a pole without some sort of orientation, like a pole, a globe, something like that, a sun that it's relative to. You need you need another region outside of that region to establish um, any sort of orientation. So is Boris on the mat or is on the mat on Boris? The mat on Boris. Right, right, right. So let me do a Karen diagram for you. So <laughs> <laughs> let's do a city here and a city here. And to consider both of them, we need a larger region with both of them around. But, you know, is it like this or is it like this, right? Oh shit! I guess. <laughs> I, the you, iPad clearly has an idea. You need an iPad to determine the orientation. That's the that's the additional <laughs> that's thing, it. right? That's the additional thing, yeah. Right. It sounds like the North is always staying North. I don't know what your problem is. <laughs> but that's the point. I mean, you need poles. You need a globe. You need something to orbit around something else to determine that relationship. You, you need. You always need that extra item, right? And then what determines that orbit? You need well. You but, need but, but, I don't think you galaxy. Yeah, I don't think you do um, because it can be internal to uh, the first two. So, like I said, like um, each city will have uh, um, asymmetries internal to it, and you can relate those asymmetries to uh, the asymmetries of the two cities in the larger region. And you don't need a, I mean, that, that, there's no regress. It's just, it's just those two uh, regions, the the country and the city. So just, just, I, I don't know. I, do you want to draw it? I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure that that's the way you get something like south of. Right. It's it's where you get an yeah, asymmetric no, I, I, relationship I of. I I agree. You don't get maybe, south. Yeah. It's not a good example. So I'm trying to fix it. Right. That's why I said that cities have orientations. Yeah. Right. There's the side of the city where the opera house is, which is not in the dead center of the city. And then Australia has a side as well. There's the side where it is closest to Indonesia. But wait, that's just the regress going inside <laughs> instead of outside, right? You still have to keep drawing these different regions going inside yeah, to determine the orientation. Just, there, there, there is two different scales, right? Yeah. But that's not a regress because it's only two. Well, no, because I'm, I'm doubting whether or not you can establish orientation by just picking out two points within the city. You're going to need yet a third thing to determine orientation, and that's going to then lead you to kind of zoom no, out no, again. The, the, the two things within the city is the orientation within the city. So you're using the city to determine the orientation, right? But you're that's sort of parasitic on the city itself having an orientation, which is going to be relative to another city. No, of a it's, larger it's, city. It's, it's not, no, it's not relative to another city. It's relative to the country it is in, that it is a part of. Um, right, you're just, you're just changing some reference point to determine the orientation of some part you're considering, but you haven't established the, the source of the orientation, you're gonna have the same issue. Okay, I'll, I'll, okay let, let me put this back. Um, Canberra is north of Sydney in actuality. Within Sydney, let us say, because I, I, unfortunately I don't know any of these places, so um, I'm making it up. I'm gonna say the Opera House is in the Southern part of Sydney, okay? And I'm going to say that city, the Canberra's City Hall is in the Southern part of Canberra. Okay, so um, epistemic considerations aside, because this is not an epistemic question, uh, there is a determinacy, okay, to whether uh, the, the orientation of the opera house 
in relation to Sydney, the orientation of the city hall in relation to Canberra is the same as the orientation of city of Sydney in relation to Australia. You don't need to know where on the globe Australia is. In fact, you could rotate Australia together with those two cities and those relations would be maintained. Something would be maintained. Yeah, I, I agree with you. But, but what is the- I call it South. It's not South, it's not Southernness. Obviously, like I said, that's a bad example. The question is whether um, uh, whether um, the relative location of Sydney and Canberra with respect to Australia would be maintained if you rotated Australia, and I think it would be. Well, I mean, I could you you could say, well, look, I I'm going to define on this in this way that the mat had top, so. To be on the mat, you have to be in contact with what is the top, and and Boris has a bottom, <laughs> right? So, for him to be on all the, all that all that has to do is God has to create Boris, God has to create the mat, but also God has to create this business. But Boris is still on the mat, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And so that would be more like your yeah, your yeah. example is like that. So, so does this mean that you know God's created some irreducible relational fact? No. Um, it or, isn't irreducible because there is the spatiotemporal, not to be confused with mirror, uh, mirrorological, a spatiotemporal fusion of those two objects, and that is the bear mat. Right. I think that, yeah, that's what Parson suggests. I mean, even though God's waving this around, um, I'm playing the role of God in the short production. Um, <laughs> so it's not like some fixed spatiotemporal thing but it's the the fact that Boris's posterior oh, is. part is on the it top is, part of the it, it is fixed thing. it is so. fixed it is a fixed spatiotemporal thing you fixed the bear to the mat in a very particular way a fixed way so yeah so I'm so not fixed in terms of like some spatiotemporal set grid with a with a no, it coordinate is. that it's occupying it is. It's just that the grid is moving with you as you move them. Ah, uh, I see. Hmm. But so, so that's a space-time grid that, that's the other thing that God's created is a, is a local space-time grid? Well, I, I don't want that's to call it a grid because that makes it sound like it's a conceptual scheme. That's the way we measure space, but that's not space itself. Space is an entity. And what if the anti-reductionist just says, yeah, that's what I call a, 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 a structured relationship. Then that would be what, um, then, um, I mean, I think in order for these structured relationships to be uh, interestingly different from what the reductionist is proposing, as the truth maker for relational propositions, they have to be distinct from the truth makers of monadic propositions. And um, insofar as we can say true things about space as an entity, then I don't think we've succeeded in doing that. Space as an entity or this thing? Well, for the example, just that, that thing, right? But, but more broadly speaking about spatial temporal relations, it's space as a whole. Wait, so yeah, space, it, I mean, it, I, mean it, I think you've, you've, you've eliminated minimal truth makers because everything no, would be, you need no, all, no. you need, you need space time. You need space time always. That, that's going to be the maximal space. You, 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 you need this. You need this amount need, of space time. You you need <laughs> currently, I guess. You need space time as a whole, to uh, as a truth maker for all the truths. But the point of minimal truth makers 
uh, is that some truths require something less than the whole world to make them true. And that, that remains the case, in my view. You don't need New York to make it true that Sydney is south of Canberra. You only need Australia. Right. I mean, so this is this sound, sounds a bit like what Parsons is trying to do on 224 when he brings in Kim. Yeah. Right? So he uh, says... Kind of, yeah. I'm not sure. I didn't fully understand it. Okay, so if we just go through it, he says, uh, so this is the first full paragraph on 224. It seems to oh. me that an anti-reductionist account of relational facts like Armstrong's cannot really be fully described without falling back into a version of reductionism. The reason is that the vocabulary of the anti-reductionist metaphysics itself gives us non-relational propositions that describe the structure of the supposedly irreducible, irreducible relational facts. For example, Armstrong writes of the internal difference of organization that exists between A's loving B and B's loving A. If there is such an internal difference of organization, we can introduce non-relational properties that apply to states of affairs in virtue of their internal organization, in the same way that I introduce non-relational properties that apply to Australia in virtue of its internal organization. Suppose there's a, such a thing as the state of affairs of Canberra as being south of Sydney, and that it is organized in the way in which Armstrong holds that irreducible states of affairs are, complete with the relation places and internal differences of organization. For convenient reference, let's call this state of affairs Kim, and its internal organization Kimity. There is a perfectly good proposition that Kim has Kimity, which in fact Armstrong would assert were we to ask him to explain his metaphysics of irreducibly relational facts, right? So I could say like, I had this problem that, you know, I can see how God could create the mat and the bear and therefore make something that's the mat that's taller than the bear. But it seems like God has to do something else besides creating this and this to get the bear on the mat. And so, uh, but we can say, well, look, here's this state, state of affairs that is the bear on the mat that has an internal relationship of being on this, and let's call it Kim. And then Kim can be a, a non-relational truth maker for the bears on the mat because, Kim has the structure that puts the bear on the mat, the non-symmetric structure, but Kim is Kim, right? Kim is not a, a, a relation that cannot be reduced. Kim is a state of affairs, which is a thing. Yeah, the reason, I mean, I, I, I kind of like the outline of what he's saying, but I'm not sure Armstrong would, and I'm thinking I would side with Armstrong in response, because I think the states of affairs for Armstrong are meant to be um, distinct from uh, things. So they're meant to be something other than the objects that have certain properties or that are so related. They're meant to be um, something like universals. Actually, they are universals, but he has a way of understanding universals I haven't fully understood and which is stops short of uh, what he calls excessively realistic conceptions. And he, he, he's, he tries to chart a middle course between what he calls excess realism and excess nominalism, uh, but to a superficial reader seems more realistic than nominalistic. And um, so if that's the case, then the reason it's distinct from the view that I'm defending is that I, I would sooner say that whatever universals he has in mind to function as truth makers for the South of relation, um, well, I'd have to better understand them to criticize it. But what I would want to say is just that Australia is not a universal or a relation. Uh, sorry, it's not, it's not a property or a relation in the sense in which we think of universals as distinct from the objects that are so related. Instead, it's just one more object. And so with respect to truth makers, if we want to have now, I haven't fully thought this out, but if we want truth makers to be the objects, um, no, I just haven't thought it out. But as you know, 
Uh, what truth makers are will be sensitive to whether they ought to be objects or universals or some combinations of them. And uh, I think it's useful to recognize that insofar as objects can be truth makers for monadic properties, then we will want objects to be the truth makers or rather non-universals particulars to be the truth makers for relational uh, propositions as well, or dyadic propositions as well. And so I think Australia fits the bill. And so does space-time itself as an entity. And yet I don't want to deny that there are universals. I'm just not sure that I want uh, relations to be made true in a different way than non-relations are made true. Mm. I just don't know what states of affairs are for Armstrong. You know, when I first started reading Armstrong, I thought he was uh, more, I thought he was realistic without qualifiers. But now I, I know from his book, I only read the preface, but he's very clear. His opinionated guide to, to what? To realism and nominalism or something like that? So, you know, no, no, it's the opinionated guide to universals. He basically says he wants to steer clear of excess realism. And I'm beginning to think that he wants to steer clear from my kind of excess realism, which is why Parsons sees an opportunity to attack states of affairs as being cryptically, basically just one more object, a Kim, of which monadic properties can be attributed, namely committee. Mm -hmm. So remember, the target here isn't me, it's, it's Armstrong. So it's kind of hard to locate myself without being better versed with Armstrong. But apart from their dispute, I am interested in the Bradley regress of relations, uh, especially as it might relate to your thoughts and what you think about these things. Like that very last paragraph is very troubling to me. Well, actually we should say the last two paragraphs. The last paragraph is what's troubling and the second to last paragraph is why it's troubling. <laughs> let's, let's take a look at that. He says, some light has been shed on the origins of analytic philosophy. Russell's argument against Bradley was mistaken. This tends to undercut the widespread view that Russell's rejection of Bradley's views about relations was the decisive break that issued in analytic philosophy as we know it. Rather, if we apply my argument against anti-reductionism to Russell himself, we see uh, that it is hard to distinguish the most coherent form that his theory of relational facts could take from the theory he ascribes to Bradley. It's no coincidence, I think, that it is an argument of Bradley's, the regressive relations that is best used to motivate an ontology of facts as against a substance attribute in metaphysics. Analytic metaphysics has much to learn from its roots in Hegelian idealism. I want to add that um, Lewis seems to be another opponent of um, Parsons here, and maybe for the same reasons, but I'm just not sure. But what is substance attribute metaphysics? Is it the view that all the truth makers mu must amount to um, reducible relational facts? No, that's not it. It, can't, it, has, it has to be the opposite, right? Because he's, he's wanting to defend a reduction. Because Parsons wanting to defend reductionism, am I right? Uh, yes. Right. So he thinks that Russell's primary argument against uh, anti-reductionism, meaning the, the primarily the 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 um, the asymmetry argument, right? That there's an asymmetry in the relation that it does not exist when you just describe the relata. Right. Um, so then, what is a substance he says that's in this context? Subject. I take it to be a dualism of substance and attributes. 
Um, yeah, maybe it's just that if you look, if you have a metaphysics that just says there's substances and properties of substances, it's going to be hard to have Kim's and Kimity, maybe. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I'm inclined to think that Bradley's Hegelianism in this context is something like a rejection of the dualism of substance and attributes. Mm. And that uh, a reductionist truth maker account is friendly to that rejection insofar as the truth makers all end up being entities, like non-universes. Well, I thought, you know, I'm going to, go ahead, Joshua. I, I thought the uh, hexadeism was the substance attribute target, right? And so I, I thought that's, this was a callback to that, right? Where you hold oh. some object with a fixed index, but you change every essential property and you still have that thing. He says, that's not gonna work. It's gonna lead to this regress problem. So whether you're an essentialist or, you know, Let's review is, that. Actually, I yeah. didn't understand that at all. Where, where is that? I have I have gone to I have gone to Wikipedia for answers. <laughs> <That's actually laughs> kind of useful. I almost went to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Very useful, but always really too long to read <laughs> while you're doing something else. So, um, but it says that Bradley raises the problem. Mm -hmm. This being Bradley's regress, which is this blissfully short entry in Wikipedia. Um, raises the problem while discussing the bundle theory of objects, according to which an object is merely a bundle of properties. This theory raises the question of how the various properties that together comprise an object are related when they in fact compromise an object. More generally, the question that arises is what has to be the case for any two things to be related. Bradley's regress appears to show that the notion of two things being related generates an infinite regress. Suppose, for example, that A respects B. This state of affairs seems to involve three things, A, B, and the relation of respecting. For the state of affairs of A respecting B to obtain, it doesn't, however, suffice that these three things, A, B, and the relation of respecting exist. There must also be related in some way. What is required, we might say, is that A and B stand in the relation of respecting. But now we seem to have another state of affairs, the state of affairs of A and B standing in the relation of respecting. The state of this state of affairs in turn seems to involve four things, A, B, the relation of respecting and the relation of standing in. Again, however, for it to be the case that A and B stand in the relation of respecting, it doesn't suffice that these four items exist. They must also be related in some way. What is required, we might now say, is that A, B, and the relation of respecting stand in the relation of standing in and so on ad infinitum. So this is just the problem of predication. We just read a whole book on by Davidson. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, I don't really understand that either. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying really hard not to understand this problem because I, I'm, I'm deeply <laughs> suspicious. I'm deeply suspicious of whether it really is a problem or not. In fact, there's another series of papers that I'm reading um, motivated by a reading of Plato's um, third man argument in Parmenides. And he seems to be speaking my language, uh, saying that there is no problem. But I'm, I'm, I'm in the weeds right now, so I can't really expound on it, but maybe we could read that. But, but with respect to just relation, just going uh, with whatever resources we have. Uh, What it is for one thing to be related to another. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm. Can you walk me through it? I mean, what's wrong with just saying that what it is for one thing to be related to another is for them to be parts of a third thing such that that third thing has certain characteristics which we might identify as just the um i guess then you're that relation 
I mean, it's basic. My point is that it's the relation is a monadic property of the whole. Well, it's and as long as the part whole relationship isn't a relationship really, it's something else. Then I guess you could understand you could explain relations that way. Uh, the part whole relation is um, is also a relation, and what of it? Well, if you're saying if it's what explains a, it's, relation it's also, is no, that no, something is yeah. a part of something, then no, okay, look, I get it, I get it. The, the part whole relation is a relation, but it is also a monadic property of the whole. So there's no regress, it's just an identity in that case. Because you don't, like for, for B to be a part of A, is for A to have a certain property. But you don't need a third entity because A was one of the relata. So there's no regress. It might be circular, but there's no regress. No, that's the having of the property that introduces the regress. Go on. But I mean, I mean that's it. You're just saying the problem is if it's not a problem. I, I don't. So when you when a regress should like exhaust the letters of the alphabet, right? But I only see myself using A and B. You're just not you're just not you know going through the alphabet. <laughs> well, because so, I don't because because I don't need to because because A and B are sufficient to refer to everything in play. No, I mean so if 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 something so is a part you... something is a part of a whole, what makes it true that it's part of that whole? If you say the it whole. has the power you said it the, the whole having a property makes it true no 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 no. the whole is the truth maker no no, no. what's the truth maker for the relationship um the what makes it true that... well the whole including it's like when we say okay look what makes um it true that the apple is red is it the apple or the redness of the apple well, I mean, it's both because the red, the apple is constituted by its redness. It is constituted by its properties. So what makes it true that the skin of the apple is part of the apple? Well, yeah, again, it, the apple, because among the apple's properties are the having of that skin. But you don't need a third entity other than the apple and the skin. No, it's the having of the skin that introduces. No, the there is no the such. Having... There, there is no such object as the having of skin. Okay, distinct as the. I mean, you could, of course, there's new phrasing and so new nuance to what can be said, but it's the same object as the apple. Right. So if you, I think you're just. You're nominalizing um... a proposition when you say the having of the skin. Okay, but truth makers are not nominalizations of propositions. <laughs> I mean, I don't disagree with you, but it, it seems to me that it leads to a rejection of a coherentist account of, of truth, because you're rejecting this isomorphic relation between statements about properties and having of and relationships and just saying, those aren't no, things I'm not, in the world. I'm not rejecting that, that, that propositions are isomorphic to other propositions, uh, or rather expressions, uh, other expressions that have that same proposition as content. Of course, they're isomorphic because they have the same proposition as content. What I'm rejecting is that propositions are truth makers for their propositions. But you're right, that is a rejection of the coherence theory of truth. Remember the whole point of correspondence, I mean, sorry, of truth maker theory is to give a metaphysical account of correspondence. So you would expect right. me to reject the coherence theory of truth. Uh, I thought you were pro truth maker theory. I am, I am, which is why I reject the coherence theory of truth. That's right. I'm um, sorry. Yeah, I misspoke. I meant correspondence theory. Um, oh, I, I'm not again? sure how I'm not sure how you find truth makers for statements or propositions about properties without finding a truth maker that makes that relation true. I mean, that's propositions I, about properties. Uh, you're going meta there, and I'm not sure it's necessary. Like when I that what what makes it true that the skin of the apple as part of the apple is not a truth about properties. It's a truth about the apple and its skin. Now it is well, okay, true so that 
they, right so the predicate has the property yeah i guess i'm confused because i mean if you predicate redness of an apple and i know you accept universals it seems like you are attributing a property to the apple <laughs> and so they're having that, that there's like sort of having or instantiating there's some sort of metaphysical relation that yeah. i feel like you're just not analyzing and saying you don't see the problem i mean i don't, oh, I don't I'm, not, person, I'm, not, so I'm, I'm fine rejecting that way of speaking but i, I thought that's your position i'm not analyzing it because i don't need to but not because i don't want to not because i can't um mm. of course we can talk about properties we can talk about universals uh it would be a form of um, it, it would be a way of nominalizing all the elements in play, and then we would have propositions about propositions, propositions about the truth maker relation, propositions about the metaphysical categories of the truth makers, and we can do that. Um, but that's not a regress. That's our own semantic ascent. Well, no. Is Redness is a universal. It's it's something shared by all the red things. And uh, yeah, of course. Right. But, but what if what is it to share in redness, to have redness? I mean, that's I'm just not hearing you speak to that. Like well, it well, virtually you didn't ask. I mean, we were, well, that's a different question. I mean, we can talk about that, but I thought we were talking it's, about it's the answering you know, that question that leads to like Bradley's regress. However you answer that question is then going to lead to all these these issues. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I'm not sure I agree with that, but let's try. So, so the question is, what is it that all the red things have in common? Well, um, redness. <laughs> right. Okay. So what is, yeah. What's, what, what comes after that? What is redness and what is the having of it or the instantiating of it? Red, redness okay. is a property. Um, mm -hmm. To instantiate a property is to be something that has it. I'm not okay, sure. So what, is, what is the having of it? Right. Again, these are just synonyms. These are just all ways of saying the same thing. To, to say that something has a property is to say, uh, in a grammatically convoluted way, for reasons that grammar imposes when we need to talk about predicates as, um, um, you know, as subjects. Uh, but, but I guess I'm not seeing a question here other than a chasing of synonyms. Well, know? um. There are different ways of saying the same thing. Rod Apples Rodrigo, are, are you yeah. are you basically taking and going here back to Wikipedia? It sounds like you might be taking Bradley's route out of the regress, which is root according to wikipedia yeah he says in appearance and reality bradley seems to conclude that the regress regress should lead us to abandon the idea that relations are independently real one way to take the suggestion is is recommending that in the case of a respecting b we are dealing with a state of affairs that has only two constituents a and b it does not in addition involve a third item the relation of respecting to which a and b must then bear some further relation standing oh, oh, in oh i see yeah right so now, um yeah and so then you can see why Russell um, responds to it by saying, well, no, because that sounds like you're reducing the relation between A and B to just A and separately B, but then that's that doesn't allow you to capture the important asymmetry in some relations, right? right? So, um, you know, the notion of, B, of um, A being south of B uh, you can't just say there's just two things, A and B, and there's nothing further. Um, because you can have A and B without them one being south of the other. All right. Um, you need something else. I'm lost. Too many things were said. I got confused. Well, um, yes. So what does I mean, Bradley just... say? He says there are no, what is his claim is that there's no apparently it's that okay so just the first sentence you start you start with okay yeah um he, he says the regress should lead us to abandon the idea that relations are independently real one way to take this suggestion says wikipedia is as recommending that in the case of a respecting b we are dealing with a state of affairs that has only two constituents a and b so in your example it'd be in the case of a is a part of b we have we're dealing with a state of affairs that has only two constituents, A and B. 
it doesn't involve a third item, the relation of being a part of to which A and B must then bear some further relation, right? So that sort of sounds like what the position you were putting across, right? Uh, yeah, I'm not that, sure. I'd have to think about it. But like, if, if, if A is related to B because A respects B, well, we're not going to be able to say that A is a part of B or that B is a part of A. We're going to have to say that A and B are part of a third thing, C. And then we have to fall back on explaining what it is for A to be a part of C and for B to be a part of C in the relevant ways. And how is respect going to get into that by introducing a third thing? What is it like a... C is the respect. Skip. That ex exists independently of B? Well, it's not independent. Um, or A? It's, it's I get not, an A in I, this case? It depend, it, I mean, what kind of independence are we talking about? I mean, certainly the respect depends on who is respecting and who is being respected. So it's not independent in that sense. That's, I mean, that's, I think, Russell's point, right? That um, if, you, if you're trying to get rid of A respecting B, then it doesn't, by saying all we have is A and B, it doesn't distinguish between A respecting B and B respecting A, and there's an important distinction between the two things, right? So you have to have a, a, an, an ontology that allows you to capture um, the difference well, between A respecting B and B respecting A, or A being a part of B and B and B part of A. My, um, and so yeah. my, for him, my, he says, you, yeah. look, you, what you have is the relation and the relations are real. So if we want so, to go with mm -hmm. Parsons' view of saying, instead of saying the relations are real, we come up with some third thing and say um, that that state of affairs um, makes it real. Well, I, I think those their positions are not um, strictly negations of one another. Uh, so Russell is wanting to say, if I understand it correctly, that relations are not all internal. So not all relations are reducible to, um, to just the monadic properties of the relata. So if, if mm -hmm. A respects B, it can't just be something about A and then something else about B. There's gotta be a third thing, mm -hmm. right? And then he says, that's the relation. Well, what Bradley says, um, is that relations can't exist for some reason, uh, his regress argument, right? But, but I'm not taking the view either that relations well, don't exist, that, in, that external relations don't exist, nor am I taking the view that there must be something to make it true that A respects B that we would call a relation. I'm instead taking the view that there is a third thing, C, of which A and B are parts, that is not itself a relation, but rather something which has a monadic property such that uh, the relation supervenes on that monadic property. So that doesn't seem to be Bradley's view. Well, I don't think I don't think Par I don't think Parson is 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 denying that there are relations. He just says that there are relations that are reducible to. Yeah. So what um, I'm describing is a reducible one, relation. Right, and so he thinks that um, the the difference between South and bigger than is that the okay, but thing not... you is 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 about is that you reduce south to the parts and you, re no, you no. reduce bigger than to the parts and you reduce south to the whole. Right, yeah, there's, okay. So what he describes as an irreducible relation um, between A and B is a relation that cannot be reduced to the monadic properties of A plus the monadic properties of B, okay? But uh, what I'm considering, and maybe I just don't know whether this makes me a reductionist or an anti-reductionist. What I'm saying is that you can reduce relations to um, um, the whole of which A and B are parts. You can, you can, sorry, you can reduce it to the properties of the whole of which A and B are parts. And, yeah, um, I think that's Parsons' view. I think so too, uh, but I'm not really sure 
uh, that um, that there isn't yet some difference because again, he's saying we have a lot to learn from Hegelian idealism, and that scares me. So I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> also, enough. he makes also he makes a fuss over um, um, the intrinsicality of truth makers, and I'm not sure I agree with that either. Um, but then I don't really know I, I, that I understood the bit about hexaity and, and what that's supposed to, how this is supposed to impact anything. Where does he talk about his hexaity? I think that might be worth talking uh, about. Page 222. Yeah, how about, um, yeah. It might be objected, I think is that it? Two ways of putting the part, no, that's not it. Yeah, no, it is, it is. Okay, so let's go before that. Okay, the whole is what one gets by putting together the parts of Australia. It is wrong to say that the two ways of putting Australia together do not differ, they do differ. One is the way that it is actually put together, the other is the way that it is not. The way that Australia actually is, is a property of Australia. And there is, there is a proposition that describes this property to Australia. Yeah, that's, you know, so far so good. We're Canberra not to the south of Sydney. Uh, oh, shoot, I was getting it backward the whole time. Crap. Uh, <laughs> uh, this proposition would not be true. Uh, and the fact that makes it true would have to be intrinsically different. Oh, I see. He's talking about the intrinsicality of Australia, not the intrinsicality of Sydney or of Canberra. Then yes, that is my view. I think the truth maker of the South of relation is due to the intrinsicality of Australia. Yeah, I agree with Parsons. And now that I understand how he's making use of intrinsicality. Yeah. Sydney is in the South, Canberra. I think he's, he's thinking counterfactually there. Oh, I'm looking on a map. I'm pretty sure Sydney is the South of Canberra. <laughs> Can we just say New York and Boston, like normal people? <sighs> San, San Francisco and San Jose, let's just stick to what we know. Yeah, let's, let's, let's keep it local, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wanna be, um, yeah, I wanna be pro-podians, not antipodians. Oh, no, Canberra is the south of Sydney. I take it all back. <laughs> wrong, wrong, wrong. Sorry, Australia. We should know better. Sorry, Australia. We've done you wrong. <laughs> I mean, in my defense, if I were to visit Australia, I would probably only go to Sydney and Melbourne. So I still wouldn't know. Well, and you would pass Canberra right by on the way. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's between Sydney and Melbourne, apparently. Oh, there you go. Maybe I should just visit. Okay, how about this? If we accept Hixaitism, uh, we think that it is possible that Canberra should have all its properties swapped with Sydney. It would no longer be true that Canberra is small. It appears, however, that the world would be intrinsically just the way it actually is. The world, it will seem, does not make it true that Canberra is small because the world may be just as it is and Canberra not be small. Because of the monotonicity of truth making, it follows that the world does not include a truth maker for Canberra is small. To fully resolve these kinds of problems that take us beyond the scope of this chapter, the point is to note that it is the problem note is that the problem is nothing to do with relations, but rather to do with the possibility of hexaitistic differences between duplicates. Okay, I think that passage there is what I'm missing uh, to, to decide whether or not I like a person's answer. Um, he mentions that Lewis would complain that you can't swap all the properties of Sydney and Canberra because you would just nullify the swap. Sydney would remain Sydney and Canberra would remain Canberra. 
You know, that, that does make sense to me. You know, when we ask, what would you do in my place? Like, if you ask me, if I, if I were to ask, if you were to ask me what I would do in your place, I would say, well, I would, exactly, I would do exactly what you would do, because in your place, I would have all of your characteristics. Um, really, what we mean to ask is, what if I had all your circumstances, but I had my character, my memories, my personality? But then I wouldn't really be swapping with you entirely. I would only be swapping certain things. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to swap everything and retain identity, unless you accept hexaitism. So I'm perfectly willing to accept hexaitism as a stipulative matter in the sense that when considering other possible worlds, I don't want identity to be driven by the resemblance relation that Lewis makes so much of. I'm willing to say that uh, that it can be arbitrary. So, um, but I don't I don't know what I don't know how that affects truth maker essentialism. I have I didn't understand that part. Did either of you? No, he just makes one distinction for truth maker essentialism. Um, you just need it to be the case that the fact that Australia is such that Canberra is south of Sydney is distinct from Australia itself. I, I, I kind of just want to punt on this until we read the other paper. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, this is about understanding what is the intrinsic properties of, of Australia such that it's still recognizably the Australia we refer, refer to when we say Australia. Well, be, right, because it's going to be some property that Australia has that makes these these orientation claims true about the sentences, right? And so the nature of that property is, is crucial. And so for his view, you don't need to say anything more than just that it is a property. But for the essentialist view, they do need to say more. There needs to be this extra distinct, distinction. But I, I just, I don't quite see it, and I would like to, because it feels very important. <laughs> right. Um... So if, if the way Australia is, is a property of Australia, um, then an Australia with Sydney someplace else would not be Australia, I guess, right? Um, well, no, because it's not an essential part of it. Like I'm, I don't even know if I'm a truth maker essentialist or not. I think I am. I think that's just the necessitarian axiom that we talked about earlier. Oh, is it just that for the truth maker essentialist, containing Sydney can't be essential to being Australia? Is, is that all that he's saying? Because then it would not be Australia and then it could not have that property, the essential property? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know how it relates to the Australia example, but he defines essentialism early, earlier um, uh, on 219 as um, in this way. Many truth maker theorists hold that every fact essentially makes true only and only those truths that it makes true. A doctrine I call truth maker essentialism. This leads them to define making true thus. X makes P true if and only if X is essentially such that P. Um, see, I don't really know what he means by essence, uh, but he gives a couple of other definitions. To put it another way, a counterpart of X cannot exist without X being true. Ah, uh, forget that one, that third one. Um, P cannot become false without the destruction of X. That seems to me clearly true. 
uh, unless of course you're dealing with disjunctions or something. But but the point is that um, that um, it isn't only the intrinsic properties of the truth maker that contribute to its truth making relation with the proposition that it makes true. Actually, um, is hexaity um, intrinsic? This is your earlier question, right, Karen? Well, no, I think. Oh, oh uh, no, I was saying that maybe the hexaity was what distinguished duplicates from counterparts. That they oh, okay. are in. They're like counterparts but that with where the hexaity is the, is constant whereas counterparts are not us right they don't have the same hexaity i mean it seems to me that hexaity can't be part of the intrinsic property of a thing uh, unless i just don't understand it at all like if if I, if I clone something if i duplicate something it won't be the thing that i duplicate it won't be this thing, it'll be another thing. They'll have two right. different thisnesses. Oh, right. Even though they have all the same internal properties. <laughs> Quality, not all the same, not all the same internal, all the same intrinsic ones. Yeah. Intrinsic, yeah, exactly. Right. So yeah, hex80 can't be an intrinsic property. Right. So um, if if you if something is a truth maker for something else. And then you duplicate it, and then you destroy the original. Is the proposition that that truth maker was a truth maker for still true? Well, it seems to me that it might be. It depends on whether the proposition um, depends on the hexaity of what was duplicated. In other words, whether it refers to it by indexicals. Is yes. Hexaity just that you can rigidly designate an individual and then counterfactually strip them of every single property. Yeah. And still say true things. Right. Whereas I mean, if that, you if you had yeah. if you had like um an, an essentialist, you would say no, you can't say strip them of their genetic code or something like that and still have so right. So, like, I, if I if I think if if I think that there's a sort of hexaity to me, I could say, you know, there's a there's a possible world where I have a different genetic code. There's a possible world where I'm an iguana. There's a possible world where I'm a cube of cheese. There's, you know, mm -hmm. and but I've just there's, you know, I'm still fixing. That's what it's about. Once yes. you fix an individual, you can still say true counterfactuals about, you know, there's no there's no essential property. Well, except that one, maybe. Except you're being the individual that you are. Mm -hmm. um, right, which is why they say it would be possible for Canberra and Sydney to swap all their properties but retain right. their identities in the way described above. But by the way, those um, moda, those questions, those middle questions, are precisely, I think, what motivate uh, hexaity. Because right, you want look, to be able to say you might have had a different genetic code, you might have had different parents, you might have been born somewhere else, you might have been a block of cheese. That's meaningful right. to some people, and and the only way to make it meaningful logically is to introduce anxiety. So, to so I think this is why this all why Parsons is bringing this up is if you look at his argument against Russell, is that Russell basically says um, we can't capture the truth that Canberra is south of Sydney just by describing all the truths about Canberra and you know all the intrinsic truths about Canberra and all the intrinsic truths about Sydney um, because that even if you put those together as a whole um, it's symmetric so you're going to get no way to distinguish a whole that is a b from a whole that is BA or a whole that is Sydney Canberra versus a whole that is Canberra Sydney, right? Mm -hmm. So if you just describe the properties and you put them together in some mirror logical whole, 
then you're not going to be able to um, distinguish your SC from your CS. And you need to be able to do that to be able to explain south this because it doesn't have that kind of symmetry. It's not flippable. You need to be able to distinguish an SC from a CS. And so then Parson says, but wait a minute, if you're talking about the whole being an actual thing like Australia, then um, the two ways of putting together Canberra and Sydney do differ, right? There is a difference in SC versus CS difference that's intrinsic to Australia, the actual Australia you're dealing with. So now you think about the Australia you're dealing with with all the buildings and people in the places that they are. But then you have this counterfactual that you keep, you keep all of that the same. Every human being's where they are, every, every building's where they are, but just have people in Australia call Sydney Canberra and Canberra Sydney. Right. Then is that a case where, um, Australia is intrinsically identical, the whole is intrinsically identical, but suddenly Sydney is south of Canberra versus, rather than Canberra being south of Sydney. And he right. says that this is a problem of Hesseity, his not, my, not my way of doing things, right? Because my way of doing things is to say, look, uh, uh, in, in Australia where Sydney is south of Canberra is a different whole than a Australia where, and different intrinsic hole than Australia where Canberra is south of Sydney. Um, and, but you could say, no, it doesn't have to be. All you have to do is switch the words that people use and that's not intrinsic to Australia, right? But that would put Sydney south of Canberra if they started okay, talking. Yeah. Right, yeah. No, I, yeah. And I so then now. he's saying, well, Okay, but no, but that is not a really a case because that's just a Hesseity issue. Can you really make Sydney Canberra just by changing the name? Right. Yeah, so I, I would say that um, if Sydney swapped, was swapped with Canberra, leaving all the qualities in place, then the directionality of their south of relation would also change. But because they haven't been swapped, then the south of relation remains what it is, asymmetric, and made true by Australia as it is, unswapped. But Australia, so, okay, but if, if what swaps is the words people use, then in the, in the intrinsic geography of Australia would be the same, right? In terms of objects are all the objects are where they are. Yeah. Well, that's why I the only I, difference is a the only difference I, is a yeah. mental difference. And that's not presumably intrinsic to Australia. Well, it's, 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 so not it's not Australia that's making um, Canberra suddenly north of Sydney. Right. So the, the let's let's call let's call the world um let's call the world as it is tim and let's call the world where everything is identical except that everybody calls sydney canberra and canberra sydney jim right now parsons has tried to say that um in in tim our world Canberra is south of Sydney. And it seems like in Jim, um, Sydney south of Canberra. But Parsons trying to explain these sort of differences by saying, well, there's the intrinsic nature of Australia that's making what's south of what true. But it seems like Tim and Jim have the same intrinsic Australia because there's not a there's not a different lo differently located person or a differently located house or a differently located um car in tim and jim well again this depends on whether um hexady is among the intrinsic properties and right 
I'm willing to go either way on that because it seems like a stipulation question. You could just stipulate it either way, but we could just consider each in turn. So if, if it is among the intrinsic properties, then uh, Jim's Australia makes things true that Tim's Australia does not. And if it isn't among the intrinsic properties, then we would have to say that truth maker essentialism um, is true, namely that intrinsic properties are not all there is to truth making. There's also the non-intrinsic properties, namely hexaity. Uh, by the way, I'm uncomfortable saying that um, taking hexaity or not taking hexaity among truth-making properties can be understood in terms of intrinsicality. So that's, that's a step that hasn't gelled in my mind yet. But my point is broader, and so it doesn't matter. My point is just, my point is just, we just need to countenance among truth makers, all that would distinguish uh, one reality, from, one possible world from another, if the truths are distinct from one world to the other. And all this consideration about intrinsicality and hexaity complicates matters, but it complicates them in proportion to exactly what needs to be done to the truth making theory uh, to, to keep things in order. And I don't see any wrinkles being introduced that can't be addressed in a straightforward way. Uh, the main thing is just to recognize in your truth-making ontology something other than propositions so that you don't fall back on coherence. And I don't see any danger of that so far. Oh, and of course, uh, being able to identify um, relations either as irreducible or reducible. But you have to say what you're reducing them to. Like, do you include hexaity among the properties that are available to the redu reduction or not? And so on. So it's difficult to answer without knowing exactly what his position is, uh, which is my fault. But, um, but after reading that other paper, I'll probably have a better sense. By the way, I'm looking at an Australian map right now. West of Canberra is a town called Wagga Wagga. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a nice place. Josh? Hi. I think you're going to love this uh, Third Man series. Yeah. I'm less satisfied with this paper now after having heard you two discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> we probably butchered it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned with this property of the whole somehow determining or serving as a truth maker. What is with Australia? South of Wagga Wagga, there's a town called Book Book. <laughs> and then east of Wagga Wagga, but west of Canberra, between the two, is a town called, literally, Want a Badgery. <laughs> <laughs> and they all have expensive hotels. OK, never mind. I think I know why I thought that Canberra was north of Sydney and it's because I think I learned about Canberra when I was learning about towns that were sort of created to be national capital capitals. So I had Brasilia in mind as being north of the major cities that you might think were the capitals of Brazil. But anyway, who knew Canberra is between Sydney and Melbourne, makes sense. Wow. Okay, I'm done. Now I'm reading headlines from Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> Move to Canberra in imminent. Don't worry, you don't have to pack up anything. We're just going to switch the name. So should we read the other one? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think we should do that. And then after that, um, 
that'll give Jenny, Kenny a chance to catch up since uh, it's just a follow up to this. Oh, one. are we going to going to read the other Parsons, or are we going to read the the next chapter in the book? Uh, I I kind of want to read the other Parsons to get okay. the juice out of this one. Um, but let's pick the next uh, truth maker one anyway. By the way, the Parsons it was going to be thirteen. The Parsons in our, in our list, I think it was truth makers. No wait. Where is, oh, here it is. There is, oh, okay. The other one is, is a truth maker paper. Now the person's is called, there is no truth maker argument against nominalism. Hmm. Uh, and what he, what he says in the conclusion is that Armstrong may have, may have successfully argued against nominalism in that book I told you about, by the way, um, uh, an opinionated guide to universals. And Parsons says, yeah, but his truth maker stuff has doesn't matter, doesn't help. Like, like maybe he successfully argued it, but it's 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 an inactive or idle premise. Hmm. Which is interesting because the whole point of truth maker theory is to try to settle some metaphysical questions. And I think Parsons is trying to hold on to um, yeah, I'm not sure what he's trying to do, but he's trying to he's trying to disrupt that that goal. But yeah, as far as the anthology, um, oh yeah, the um, 13 and 14 by Rodriguez Pereira. I think basically we wanted to read that, maybe something where you try to do without truth makers altogether. Uh, and then the, the two things by Lewis and that's it. I think we've done enough with those. Thoughts? Hmm. What's what's bothering you? I don't think this works. Think what works? <laughs> Truth makers. Oh really? Yeah. You know I don't think you understand, Josh. It has, <laughs> it has to work. It has to work. <laughs> it has to work because the alternative is a random pragmatism. I don't think that's true. What makes it true that truth makers have to be true? <laughs> What's the truth maker for that? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Yeah, have tos are tall. Tall. It is. It is. It is the disjunction between. Um, it is. It is the identification of correspondence with realism, basically. Basically, non. I mean, this is broad brush, obviously, but. Uh, anti-correspondence theories of truth, I think land you in a kind of anti-realism, not about everything, but about key things that will ultimately swallow up the rest. Sorry to be an alarmist, but I kind of feel this way. Yeah, I, I think dabbling with a an identity theory of truth has kind of resolved that concern for me. I think correspondence is probably doomed but I don't think that leads to anything like Brandom's project. Who's um, who's got the identity theory? Who are you talking about? Um, I don't have any one person in mind, but just just generally that there's a different type of relation. It's not a correspondence type of relation. I think if you hold on to any sort of relation, you can still hold on to a kind of realism. It just you have to spell that out. I just don't um, have any I, identity relation other than the early Russell idea of identifying propositions with the facts themselves. Uh, he, he, yeah, there, there are some other accounts, um, but you know, I'm, I'm not far from Russell. I'm really not far from Russell. I'm not far from early Russell or later Russell. And I do wonder if, if, if he didn't think that he abandoned the project as like Davidson kind of um, expresses it. I think yeah. he, he may have thought that he kind of like figured it out. And I think he may have. I, don't, I just don't think he was far off. Um, mm. I think the problem of predication as Davidson goes on about it, I think is, is maybe this... Um, I think it just might be the way that we, we think about truth and we might just be wrong about that. Um, and I, I don't think that 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 entails a sort of anti realism. I just think something has to be said. Um, for, so, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of uncomfortable saying that there's some property of Australia that makes these relational statements true without there being some relational 
property that makes it true. There's something wrong about saying it's reducible. Um, there should be some relational fact that makes relational statements true. It, it really should be that way, but there's not. <laughs> and I'm not sure that there are atomic facts that make atomic propositions true for the same reason. I, I think you can arbitrarily slice reality in so many different ways that it, it, it almost makes proposition talk meaningless. But I think we are talking about things. But I think it's that sort of um, isomorphic structure that's presupposed that introduces all of these difficulties with universals and predication and it all reduces to truth talk. What do we mean when something is true? <laughs> Uh, I just want to move the target. I think a lot of these problems will be solved with the moving of the target. At least that's my intuition right now. I'm mildly sympathetic to what you're saying um, because I think I was there a few months ago. Uh, but what 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 blocks my blocks me from reconsidering it is just uh, what to do about negative truths. You know, like uh, there are no flying sure. pigs. Uh, there's, there's nothing to yeah. identify that with. And it is true. Well, well there is, there is. I mean, you, you have to get into, I think if you have an identity theory, you don't have to, ha to have, um, you don't have to have singular entities or facts or, or things like that. I mean, you can have a, a piecemeal account of identity. I mean, if, if we're speaking about the world, we can certainly speak about different aspects of the world and, and the meaning of those sentences can be established by those aspects of the world, but the, the composition doesn't exist, right? And I think that's how you're going to also get an account of modality as well with a, a one world account of, of possibility. So I, I think there's a lot of moving pieces here, but you may need to solve all of them um, in order to get an account of truth and modality and semantics. Um, it just may not be possible to solve any one of these in isolation. And I think that might just be how it must be because we're getting at <laughs> the world as it is. Well, so so what you're saying doesn't sound, okay, it sounds not too far from Lewis. Okay, because remember he identifies propositions with sets of worlds. That's effectively identity. It's it's yeah. it's basically it's basically an identity theory with weird modality. Um, or, or, or like, are, are you instead right? of six possible worlds, it could be. Hmm? Was, was it Armstrong who 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 tries to? Yes, just he tries do, to do it with combinations with instead. Our world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So maybe maybe oh, because yeah, I don't think Armstrong has an identity. Theory. No, no. But no, maybe no. he does. No. Well, I no. think he might, but but because I think what makes you know for for Armstrong, if I've got it right, what makes there be the, the sentence "there are no unicorns" true is the entire world. No, not for Armstrong. For anyway, someone. I think I, I anyway I understand what you're saying, Josh. It's like you have to have a a, a more solid story on states of affairs on modality and on the relation of all of this to to a compositional -ist semantics hmm. and only then can you even begin to take identity again identity theory again seriously and, yeah. and i'm definitely open to that you might just say that i'm tackling the problem from the other end accepting non-identity and trying to solve for modality and um, and the other puzzles first, only to reconsider Russell at the end. But here's the thing: I have independent reasons for rejecting identity, which is that I want to regard propositions as abstractions from mental representations. Mm -hmm. And so, the mental representations well, are never going to be identical with what they represent. I'm always going to want, well, not always, but I, I have independent reasons for wanting to separate or from not identifying representations uh, with what they represent. Well, no, I mean, you would have to have an account of representation as being something like higher order reference, then you could preserve identity for mental states. Why, why higher order? Why not just first order? To get over around the proximal distal distinction and introduce error, I suppose. Otherwise, you just get causation as reference and you, you won't get representation that way. I just, I just, I, 
I mean, those problems do need to be solved. I just don't see how that, that makes it higher order. Uh, you, you need an account of representation, but you also need an account of reference. I mean, if you're a content externalist, right? Somehow the world gets into the content. So you don't want representation to be removed from the way that the world is, but you don't want it to be- Oh, I see what you mean by, okay. I see what you mean by higher order. In other words, not merely causation. Not merely causation, right? right. Yeah, okay, yeah, no, of course. Um, but if you have, let's say, a state that refers in virtue of its form, and it, you know, receives that form in virtue of some causal interaction, um, there's, it's not really representation yet. It's, it's when that state is taken as representing that you get the possibility of error. There, there's like this inference, though I don't think it's yet. Inference. Oh my God! No, 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 no. Okay, that takes, the inference. That's, no, the difference. That's, that's, the difference. That's, that, that's the royal road to inferentialism. No, 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 no. It's whether or not the inference is a movement between states or if it gets into the content of the state. I mean, that's the crucial distinction. I don't put the inference within the content, but I take inferences to be movements from one state to the next, right, where the content just is referential. I mean, that, that's, that, that's just the key. So I say representation is higher order reference because I think there's another state which takes as its content the reference of the first state but it represents the world, not the first state. And there is the taking of it as referring to the world and not the first state that makes it representational. But its content is derived from the referent of the first state, and that's why it's higher order. So it's getting content from the first state, which was caused by the world, but it is being taken as representing the world. It, and that's sort of the origin of intentionality or aboutness. That is how a mind can be about the world and yet not just be caused by the world because that would be the, the proximal do, do, you mind, do you mind rephrasing that without reference to the subject because when you say taken as you know that's implicitly bringing the subject in can't we just say and for, i liked the earlier way you put it which is inference is a movement from one um, um yeah. one representation to another um but it is that's in virtue I... of those movements that we call them representations or that they are representations yeah Okay. That, that's all. So, that's all I would say. The, the taking is is that movement. That's it. The taking okay. of and oh, meaning I see what is you're that moving I see what from you're one. Yeah. Yeah. Now here's the thing. So I was thinking a lot about this, <laughs> um, in trying to come up with something against Brandom because uh, I, I I I feel I'm, I have a sense of desperation in trying to respond to Brandom because I know there's a lot of strength in what he's saying and I know yeah. that it's very influential, uh, both. Uh, in that he's influenced others, but in the sense that he's representing other views that have been, deep, been deeply influential for a very long time, going back to Hegel, allegedly, and I, I'm willing to believe it. I mean, it came up today. So, um, so I, I feel an urgency to deal with it. Um, and I don't wanna just rest on Fodor because I don't know that he's taken, um, well, he's just not as influential. So there must be something more that needs to be said. And the more I thought about it, the more I think about it, the more I feel an obligation, ironically, I guess I was primed, to locate normativity somewhere mm -hmm. in here, right? And, and I don't want to locate it in the content. I don't want to locate it in the concepts of all places. Um, but I do think it needs to be located somewhere in action. Uh, so pragmatism mm -hmm. may have some core insight um, with respect to the centralization of action. Um, but the more I think about it, and, and I laid out my thoughts uh, in what I wrote in Slack, um, the more I'm being driven to, uh, to, to remove the line between sentience and sapience rather than locate it, the more I'm moved to accept I know this, this is asking a lot, but like I said, I'm being moved to it. I haven't assumed this position yet. I'm not taking responsibility for this claim just yet. <laughs> but I'm being moved <laughs> to say that thermostats have mental representations. Okay, I said it. Oh, wow. Nice and here's why. No, no. Uh, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah. Um, no, but it's not, it's not exactly the same as Dennett because Dennett is being an instrumentalist about it, whereas I'm trying to give a constitutive account that is epistemic okay. at all. Uh, my, my, my 
feeling is that um, the thermostat um, the thermostat doesn't have a concept of temperature or of the room's climate or of um, you know the users of the house or anything complicated, right? But I'm not sure why I shouldn't say that it doesn't have, why well, I shouldn't say that it has the concept of more and the concept of less and the concept of on and the concept of off because there are representations that are moved um, by perception. There are, there's, there's something that's recognizably, recognizably perception, something that is recognizably action and something that is recognizably inference. And the question that remains is not which is which, but rather, are we anthropomorphizing? And, and I want to say that we're anthropomorphizing. I want to say that it is derivative of the intentionality of the designer, the manufacturer, the installer, the owner, the user. But I'm being moved to give up on that. I'm being moved to think that if the only thing that makes causal isomorphism distinct from representation is that movement we recognize as inference. And if inference doesn't have to be formal for it to be good, an idea I borrowed from Brandon, then maybe the thermostats really are mental, just extremely simple. No. Tell me why not. And yes, I know what you're gonna say. It has to be possible for them to make a mistake. I agree with you. It's just not obvious yeah. that they can't make mistakes. So I, I, I think this works, but um, I think I, I place the source of normativity e exactly in that gap between being caused, a form being caused, and a form um, informing of an additional state. So the movement from that initial state to the second state, which is why I say representation is higher order reference. There's an error that's possible when you move from proximal um, cause as content to distal cause as content. And that's, we can call that action if that is <laughs> better. It's, it's a mental act of, of moving from the first state to the second state. Thermostats don't do that. Um, and I think that's the missing part. But I think you're right in saying it's almost all there. There's just that not, there's not that extra step of taking as <laughs> or inferring. But, you, or it's, 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 but well, I, I think there is. Again, if you if you put it in terms of taking as you're you're sneaking in a subject, and I know you, I know you don't mean to, but I'm good, I'm going to demand that you be more literal in your speech then, because when you did speak more literally, you said it was merely a movement, a movement from the, the literal. Yeah. So the literal is is moving from um, uh, proximal content to distal content. That's it. That that's that's the origin of normativity right there. That's the the mental movement or the initial action. It's the inferring. Um, it, it's moving from proximal to distal. That's it. That introduces the possibility of error. That's it. So of course, that's but also have, the- But we have that, but we have that. Right? But we have that, we have that yeah, in the first step. Also. Sure. Well, so the room might be too hot or too cold. And I'm, I'm, really it's too, it's, it's too much or too little, right? Because there's no concept of temperature, but it's, it's either too much or too little. And it's not the room, it's just, let's just say, the world is too much or too little, okay? That's distal. Uh, and what's proximal is is the switch is on or off. And, and again, we have to simplify. It's on or off. So there's there's too much and too little, and then there's on or off. And there's movement from Attitude. too much. Hmm? What was the distal um, content? I only heard proximal. More or less. More or less? So let's let's That's... let's let's suppose this is an air conditioning thermostat. Obviously, you can have one that includes both heating and air conditioning, but let's say it's just air conditioning. Um, so then uh, if it's too much, and here we mean temperature, but I'm trying to think like a thermostat. So if it's too much, then it acts to turn it on. And if it's not too much, then it acts to turn off. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, no, that, that doesn't work. No, I mean, that's just causation. <laughs> I'm not saying it isn't causation, but remember what you said. It's not that there isn't causation. It's not that it's uh, something more than causation. It's only that there's a distinction between distal and proximal causation. And no, no, it is more than causation because content, that movement. Content, sorry, content. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, 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 there, there... <laughs> 
And by the way, no, the way I, it can go I, wrong, the way it can go wrong is if um, if the switch uh, is broken, so that it like suppose the energy um, like there's like a, a failure in the mechanism, so that when it turns the switch on, it fails to get uh, the air conditioning going. Then that would be a normative normativity uh, violation. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. Well, I'm um, not seeing the requirement. I mean, I want to. I, I just, I don't know what you mean by distal and proximal. I know that you're getting it from Burge, but I don't remember Burge well enough to apply to this case. Um, I, I mean, it, it's just any application of a concept is, is necessarily going to bridge this gap. So there has to be some break in proximal, you know, uh, activity, stimulation, information, and, and some introduction, some introduction of, well, more information, more information has to be uh, represented than simply the proximal information. Well, Whatever that is, it, it can't be, it can't be like a more than relation or any sort of logical operator and conjunction. It, not, not, that's not going to be content. Those are going to be operations. Um, yeah, I don't mean, I don't mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not thinking procedurally here. I'm not thinking of this as a computer program. I'm thinking of it as um, perception. So, so if if the thermometer um, registers, and I'm speaking non mentally here, if it registers heat over a certain threshold, why should we not regard that as the content that that quantity has passed that threshold? Exactly. I'm not sure I would. I'm not sure I would deny that state content. Only that it's 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 just proximal reference. That's it. I mean, this this is almost any act of intelligence is going to lead towards what Brandom calls you know the the, the material inferential content. There, there's something in virtue of possessing a concept that that makes certain inferences appropriate. And the problem is that there seems to be no inferences available to the thermostat. There is only a what? causal response, and it's always one of two, <laughs> you know, go up or go down. There seems to be no inferences that the Brandon would, would speak of as being, you know, materially good or bad. You're absolutely and right would, that there aren't any, there, no, you're absolutely right that he would not, but that's because he is presupposing everything that I'm wondering how he's going to argue for. So I, mean, I, I don't consider that an argument. I consider that an exhibit of what needs to be argued for. Right, but I, I don't think the formalist has an has an argument for the normativity of any operation. That and I'm not offering a formalist argument. These are all material uh, uh, inferences. You know, the only inference taking place in the thermostat is from a perception to an action. Passes threshold, switch is closed. That's not a formal inference. Right. So the difficulty really, I think, comes in with um, the, the possible inferences that a thermostat could make. It, it seems to have a very limited set. And There's two. <laughs> exactly, right. Yeah. And they're, they're immediately causally uh, accounted for, right? Well, I think all inferences are causally accounted for. Not so just the thermostat have... inferences, but our inferences as well. Yeah, so I mean, that's... Outside that's the where order. Yeah. If there's nothing beyond that that causal explanation, there seems to be no origin of normal. No, I, I, did, I didn't say there's nothing beyond it. I'm just saying it can be causally accounted for. But of course, there's something beyond it. Uh, unless by beyond you mean cannot be accounted for. No, what I don't mean that at all. Oh, I, I mean, I mean, not not mere causation, right? There is there's something well, that's not mere causation that uh, it, it I, I don't know what you, I don't know what you mean. Do you, are, are you like saying that there has to be something that's uh, not reductively, like that, that is not reducible to causal a, a causal account. Is that what you mean? Like beyond in what way? What kind of transcendence are you looking for? <laughs> um, not merely causal in terms of explanation of the movement from one state to the next. But again, so there's um, like what if I were to say to you that all explanation is causal explanation would you deny that i mean or I, sorry causal or constitutive you know whatever um ye, you're just not speaking about explanation i mean i, I might explain I, it all i think i am 
or at least that's my claim. I, I think all explanation is either causal or constitutive. That to explain anything is to say what causes it and what it's made of. That's it. Um, but it's it's a distinction between the immediate cause <laughs> or the prior state of the system of which you know the world acts upon. Right? There's a difference there. Yes, it's going to be causal. Explanation will always be causal, but the immediate stimulation or the immediate um, causal act isn't sufficient for accounting for the response of the system to the proximal cause. Right? I don't understand so, that. Well, first of all, when I say it's something is causally explicable, I'm not ruling out distant causes. Uh, I mean, it's the difference between taking the, 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 pho the photon pattern on your retina as what is being represented and what the photons are you know, reflecting off of as, as being the content, right? Of course. And that, that's, that's the difference here. So is um, simply the pattern of light on the retina sufficient for the seeing of a tree? I mean, no, no, there needs, no. also needs to be the, the concept of a tree for the seeing of a tree. And there right. isn't enough, there isn't enough information within that immediate cause to explain the seeing of a tree. It's not that the overall account is not causal. It's that there isn't enough um, information. I think there is. That. I think there is. I think there is enough information so? there. Well, I mean, not if you consider it only its intrinsic properties, right? But extrinsically, it's related to where those photons came from. Um, yeah, I mean, whether you're using like a Neander account of content or like a Bayesian model of, of priors, I mean, there's something beyond that immediate event that is necessary for the explaining of the representational content. It's not, it's not a denial of it being causal, only that that singular event isn't sufficient for explaining the application of the concept or the concept at all. That's all. It's about how many events you need, I suppose. <laughs> how many causal acts is sufficient for accounting for the content of a representational state? And I think for the mental, it's always going to be more than the immediate. And I think that's part of the proximal distal distinction in terms of content. For the thermostat, there seems to be no, ne no necessary prior events whatsoever. Every event is sufficient for accounting for the response of the thermostat. Unless you smuggle in like an engineer's intent or something, and then you get into like Searle's, you know, complaints about computation just being causation that informs of an interest or something, right? Which I subscribe to. Right. Um, so, so I, I, I very much like the idea, as you know, of, uh, of introducing normativity to life and artifacts by way of uh, a selectionist meanderish account, um, but. And, and, and I'm ignoring for the moment that thermostats happen to be artifacts, uh, imagining one to have occurred in nature. Uh, and by nature, I mean, right. like, um, not life. <laughs> um, right. But the kind of normativity that Brandon is talking about isn't the kind of normativity that Neander gives us. It's the no. normativity of, of responsibility. And it seems to me that the normativity of responsibility has more to do with how we commit to actions, or rather how we commit to intentions by acting in the way that a thermostat uh, is the turning on of a switch, or rather the closing of a circuit is a kind of commitment in that whatever the causal consequences of the closing of that circuit may be, we say that what is responsible for those eventualities is that the thermostat did what it did at that time. In the way that if you, um, if you ask, why did the avalanche start when it did? And you find that initial cause that broke the stability you say that it was response that this is what was responsible for that avalanche, not in a moral way, not in a mental way, but there's a sense in which right. control and responsibility isn't um, inherently mental or um, um, or a question of agency. If anything, it's agency that depends on an understanding of control and responsibility. And so that's what I mean to say. 
thermostats are controlling the temperature of a room without mm -hmm. agency, uh, or at least deep agency of the kind you expect only in, in animals. And, and if that's right, if responsibility is something that we find in inanimate or you know, non-living nature, like what is responsible for a star's collapsing into a black hole? Well, because it's mass increased and passed the Schwartz whatever threshold. I don't remember the name. Um, if that's right, then, then there's two kinds of normativity at play here. There's the, the selectionist style normativity that gives us good, um, you know, what is a benefit to something. And then there's the kind that we find in obligation, which is what's responsible for what. And I'm inclined to think that, uh, that while you might need both for an account of mind, a full account of mind, there's something to be said about, said about each of those independently of the other. I'm not sure I see two. Well, you do yeah. see a difference between the good and the right. So those are the ones I'm referring to. Hmm. Yeah. What, 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 which one does Brandon have in mind for the content, the right, not the good, just the right? I think the right probably. Yeah. Right, and Yander's more of the good, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. that's that's why. Yeah, that's my problem. <laughs> I guess the problem is I, I, I'm not sure why you couldn't then use Neander account of the good for the right, um, because the right would then be whatever is grounded in the good, <laughs> which is like I think, I think, no, I, th I think you can. I think you can ground the right in the good, but the point is that the right can get other kinds of grounding. Sure, and it might get grounding in, uh, in. Right, but it, but if you have, if you say something like the proper function of um, uh, of a mind is to preserve truth or something like that, right, and that's what it's selected for, like operations that preserve truth in in cognitive acts. Yeah, no, I I, I agree, I agree. But my point is that um, if if there can be something that is responsible for a star going supernova, um, then it can't be anything having to do with proper functions. Is there a sense of the right or the good in those cases? Isn't it just? It seems to be neither, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it has anything to do with either. Uh, the right might just be the combination so, of the good with responsibility, but I'm after just So you can have, you can have the response, it could, you could say, well, the responsibility you've identified is, is not a normative notion at all. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's neither, I, I, neither the writer. I, I agree. I agree. But my target here is not merely to locate the normativity of thought, but to locate the difference between representation and causation. And it might be that representation is due more to responsibility uh, and that the normativity enters independently. Presentation is due to responsibility. Yeah. So Where like, that is just a causal right. matter. Right. Exactly. So it's just like the causal theory of reference, kind of. It's uh well I don't really know what the causal theory of reference is. I, I just know that I've read a whole lot about it, but <laughs> I can never really figure out what the thesis is. Um, but yeah, obviously that's that's that would be the space in which I'm thinking. Yeah. Right. This is all so very, very if yeah. So if you can make the air conditioning turn on in your house either by 
opening the window and letting in hot air or by hitting it just right, which makes the switch trigger, then you're suggesting that the, since both hitting it and letting in the hot air can be responsible for the switch triggering that the content of the triggering of the switch is a disjunction of being hit or being in the presence of hot air. Yeah, actually, that's a good example because what I would want to say is that in both cases, the thermostat is causing the air conditioning to come on, but only in the first right. case is the thermostat responsible. In the second case, I'm responsible. Well, in both cases, it was something other than the thermostat that led to the switch trigger. It was the yeah, warm but air. Responsibility the... is not a, yes, but responsibility is not about leading to, that's just causation. Okay, so why is it the responsibility of the um, thermostat? Because it was in control. It's a controller. But it, it was the, oh, I see. So So, so something like there's a series of dominoes in the um, in the air conditioner, and I'm talking about the domino that turns on the air conditioning, right? That that turns and, but you're saying because the by hitting it, you've maybe gone around some of those dominoes. You so. I mean, you've interrupted. So let's say control. there's there's basically three things that happen, and 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 one is the registering of the temperature, and if you hit it just right, that switch goes, and then there's a bunch of other things, and then the air conditioning turns on, and so you're saying it's because I kind of cut that step out, or triggered it for triggered it for the air conditioning without the air conditioning doing the registering of a temperature. So it's right. not because it, it wasn't sort of fully functional, then it's not responsible. Yeah, you you manipulated it to use the language of responsibility and control. Whereas the temperature doesn't manipulate it because all the doc, dominoes falling are falling as they were designed to fall? No, I don't design doesn't enter into it. It's um it's just um it is like, what we because you could say I'm manipulating the, so I want the air conditioning to come on because uh, I wanted to cool the upstairs of the house. So I go downstairs and I open the door in the room with the thermostat and I let in a bunch of hot air into that room, which triggers the air conditioning in the whole house. Yeah, I'd I say that's kind of manipulating the situation just yeah. as much as if I went and went I think you're boom right. on the wall. I think so you're right. in, in neither case is the, is the thermostat responsible. Exactly, yeah. I mean, this is, I think about, um, I'm, by the way, I was motivated to think about all of this because of the two or three months that I spent reading about free will on Clubhouse. Uh, and I thought it was just public service and outreach and recruitment, but I actually ended up learning a lot. <laughs> uh, I, I, my views actually changed pretty significantly. Um, I mean, I went from being one kind of a compatibilist to another kind of compatibilist, but still my views changed. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and among the views that changed was, uh, well, one of the reasons my views changed is because so many people feel a very strong impulse to question whether they are in control, uh, given that they have causal antecedents that determine their behavior. And the compatibilist uh, routinely is wanting to say that the presence of causal antecedents does not mean that you're not in control, but then they diverge exactly on what they mean by that. And what's interesting to me is that for that to make sense, uh, it can't be merely a matter of normativity because there are instances that even the compatibilist admits are cases where you're not in control because certain causal antecedents are um, disrupt your control without themselves being normative, without themselves being agential. 
it has more to do with the, the fine structure of causal relationships. I don't really know the answers here, but I have one proposal, which comes from one of the theorists that we read. It's Robert Kane. Um, he basically says, for something to be in control of something else uh, is for it to be a unique, sufficient cause. Okay. This is a modal claim. It's like a doubly modal claim. Causation is already modal, right? But then it's a mm -hmm. modality on causal relations. So the, imagine that um, A causes B and B causes C. We say that B is um, in control of C. In other words, is responsible for C if, it, if, if C happens. Um, control and responsibility are very close. Um, if if um, um, A, oh, by the way, he's an indeterminist and that matters. Okay. So if, um, if B, um, if, if C could not have happened unless B happened, um, and there is no other A such that B would not have happened if A had, hap if A had not happened. So that's so you're going to be a sufficient cause, and then secondly, be the only sufficient cause. Then you're responsible. And if there's multiple things that are sufficient causes jointly, um, or perhaps um, in an overdetermined way, then you can share responsibility. But you can so be a sufficient the... cause and not be responsible at all if you're you are yourself caused by something that is a sufficient cause of you. And that's what it is to be manipulated. But but the thermostat always has something that's a sufficient cause of it. Yeah, if you accept determinism, everything has a sufficient cause in the Big Bang, which means that the determinist has a harder way of explaining what it is to be responsible for anything or what it is to have control. But here's the tricky bit. The, the, the conventional wisdom of the professional philosopher is compatibilism. And while if you focus on questions of more responsibility, you, you may have plenty to say. If you wanna focus on the nature of responsibility and control, it's harder to come up with an account. Right, I just don't find think- a successful one. Yeah, I don't know that sufficiency is the way to go. Yeah, maybe not, but then, but then yeah. you have to come up with something else. And you could maybe do it in terms of normativity, in which case we're back to square one. But but I'm inclined to resist that because I have strong intuitions that responsibility and control isn't about agency, that it is a way of characterizing the causal relations of a system. Like if I if um, you know like uh, like in the case of the avalanche. You know, what is responsible for a cloud breaking out into a, a, a rain? Well, it's the dust particles that give it uh, the seeding and, um, and the, the cold front that came in that did such and such. That's what was responsible. Those are meaningful ways to talk. Right. You know, it's not meaningful but... to say that uh, the rain was caused by the Big Bang. It's like, I mean, sorry was controlled by the Big Bang. Yeah, it caused it because it caused everything, but it's just not what we're talking about. Right, but if I push you and you fall and break Josh's foot, you're responsible for breaking Josh's foot, right, in that definition, like an avalanche is responsible. No, but because, we would say you're not responsible. Yeah, but I don't think- In I, the other way of using the word responsible. Yeah, I don't think I'm responsible. Like it could, I mean, you could imagine reason. a, you could imagine a, a, a language that just distinguishes between causal responsibility and normative responsibility. You could, but I don't think one is responsible in any way, because, um, or I wouldn't be in any way, because you were the sufficient cause. Um, no, I couldn't both. have. Uh, let's say, let's say I, you know, I couldn't have broken Josh's foot if I didn't. I mean, if he, I needed to push you onto him. I couldn't have well, just done it with nothing. 
Yeah, but by, by being a sufficient cause for the broken foot, I don't mean that you can do it without me. I just mean that that if you pushed, like that you pushed me was enough to make it the case that his foot would be broken. I'm just an instrument. And isn't that true of the avalanche? Yes, that's my point. It's got nothing to do with normativity or agency. Right. So you are, right, so the avalanche isn't responsible for destroying the village because it's really the snow that fell on the top of the mountain that triggered the avalanche that's responsible for the um, destruction of the village. Just like it was me pushing well, you that was sufficient it, for the breaking of the foot. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it um, like, not necessarily because uh, if, like maybe the avalanche is not the right example because if, if it hadn't been that, then it would have been something else the next day. It was building up and it was reaching that threshold. So it was kind of inevitable. Um, but um, yeah, the trigger is not the right example. I'd have, to, I'd have to, I mean, I don't know. I just, I'd have to study it more. But the sense, my, yeah. my, my point here, the point of all this is to, is to point out to Josh that whereas I agree that the insight about introducing error um, by, by locate to, the insight to locate error in the in the difference between the proximal and distant causes, especially with respect to content. I I, I think that's the right track, but um, I think there are other ways, simpler ways, to um, to locate that divide when we consider something like uh, this, the fine structure of causal relationships, um, such as what is recommended in an account of control uh, in terms of sufficient causes uh, that cascade into one another. Well, the, the problem is that with any sort of control system, it's usually not external conditions that are sufficient for bringing about a change in the controller. There's some sort of aspect of internal state that is part of the causal conditions. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's, and, and that's granting enough to get away from a lot of the, the issues of free will, or at least to move one towards like a Frankfurt account of, of freedom, where there's something like, you know, endorsement or, um, consideration for reaction to the immediate conditions, right? You've, you've lost me. That, uh, controllers can be very um, non-mental entities. Of course, of course. Yeah, but, and, but they have internal will. state and they have right, internal state. We're talking about freedom of will. We're talking about will, right? Well, um, like, I don't even know why you're engaging in this topic. Cause I thought you sort of reject this, this whole framing of free will to begin with. I don't know why you're accepting the framing and then arguing for compatibilism. It's so weird to what me. Framing? Um, that there is even coherence in the concept of the freedom of will. I never said it wasn't coherent. When did I say that? Did I say that? Oh, I'm wondering why you're not saying that because you, you generally oh. the framing when the free will topic comes up, but compatible is sort of accept the frame and then say it's not a problem. Well, um, no, I think I think they try to solve the problem and they don't just dismiss the problem. But um, they no, I I, I accept the framing. Um, what, what I what I don't accept is is to build a certain answer to that problem into the definitions of the terms, but you don't have to do that. So I, I take freedom yeah. of the will to be nothing more than whatever it is about freedom that makes it possible for us to have agency. Okay, well, saying everything, it seems to me that the thermostat still lacks this um, consideration for any prior internal state for bringing about a change in no, it, does have a, it does have a prior state no uh, it seems that like the external conditions are sufficient for bringing about every change in the controller that's and that's also true yeah, yeah but they're, they're, that just doesn't both, apply to any mental well it depends if by external conditions you mean um also those initial conditions which result in the constitution of the thermostat then yeah but if you only consider the external conditions uh, that are intrinsic to the moment at which the thermostat happens to be installed, 
then no, you need the internal state of the thermostat. You need the fact that the temperature measurement, well, the thermometer, um, is is mechanistically connected to the switch and the circuit in the relevant ways. And that's not going to be given by the temperature of the room. So the, the, the air conditioning system is not controlled by the temperature of the room. Um, it, it is I'm, I'm not saying how it's not. It, because because uh, all the examples we explored, there's some fully sufficient external yeah, I'm not it, saying there isn't a sufficient it, whether you open a window, whether it's the immediate air, that's always yeah. sufficient for bringing about a change in the controller state. Always. Oh, oh, right. Um, assuming. Um... You know, last time the thermostat kicked on, Karen was upset and it remembers that. So this time it's not going to turn on. <laughs> right. There's, there's no consideration for, for past outcome. There's no feedback. Right, even basic controller um, systems can be designed to have feedback to where the internal states change and then control. Um, I mean, a thermostat doesn't have that feedback mechanism except the immediate feedback of the external conditions. I mean, it's barely a controller. It's only a controller in the sense that it responds to external conditions in like the weakest sense. <laughs> well, that's why we picked the example because it is the weakest sense. Yeah, yeah. But, but it doesn't have to be a very complicated controller to be a controller. No, but it is fully determined by external conditions. It seems so to lack. So is everything. No, that's not true. I mean, that, that's exactly the point. That's not true. I mean, this is a key insight about the mental, that the external conditions are rarely sufficient for bringing about any sort of uh, human action. I mean, it's almost priors are like absolutely necessary for any sort of um, state change with mental representation. Just basic Bayesian network, you can't get away from priors. Oh, I see what you mean. And, and uh, that's still far from the mental as far as satisfying some, you know, criteria like with reference or, I mean, you don't even have to talk about rep no, representation. I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's true for the thermostat as well. I mean, uh, the, 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 the measurement uh, device uh, may be, uh, will, not, will not immediately respond to the temperature difference. You know, its, it's state has to transition and that takes time and it'll take more time depending, or less time depending on what state it begins with. Those are effectively priors. The switch needs to be open or closed um, and it needs to be in the state that it is in in order for the other state to be brought about. It has to be all connected in a relevant way. Yeah, so I mean, there's definitely a contribution by the internal state. And I'm not saying that that's any different from priors, except of course, in degree of complexity. Um, but, but that's to say that some configuration of the switch has a representational content. And I, I, I wouldn't accept that. Yeah, no, I think it does. Like the, the switch, uh, whether if it's open, it represents um, the air conditioning system being off. And if it's closed, it represents the air conditioning system being on. Oh, I see. Yeah, no, that, that <laughs> okay. Yeah, that wouldn't be my kind of representation at all. That would just it being on or being off, not representing being on or representing being well, off. Well, it's both. Well, it, it represents to maybe an engineer or the person who owns the thermostat. No, 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 but it... I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about interpretation. Uh, I'm talking about um, action. So it's um, um, the, the switch being closed is not the same thing as the machine working. Okay, There has to be, by, by the air conditioning system being on, I mean, that system doing all the things that it does when energy is flowing through it. With the switch, by the switch being closed, I mean, um, uh, the action that is taken um, by the controller such that um, um, well no what I mean is um, no that doesn't quite work um, No, I don't know. 
I, I feel the force of what you're saying, namely that there needs to be some distance uh, between representation and the, represent, the represented. But given that the temperature of the room does not in any way resemble the uh, the 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 status of the air conditioning unit, and that what stands between them is the controller, that seems to be distance enough. You just need distance from the perception to the action, and that's that's there. Of course, more distance can be introduced between layers of perception or representation and the cognitive side, and layers of intention or action, rather layers of action or intention on the cognitive side. But that is seemingly more about the complexity of content and its distance from causation, but not a qualitatively distinct, uh, yeah, distance. Yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not seeing the distance, but uh, I mean, yeah, I'm happy to revisit this later. I, I know there's a lot we could read on this, and yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to figure out what to read. I mean, that's that's the point of the conversation. It's like um, maybe Dretsky, maybe um, Dretsky's huge, yeah. Meander, uh, Burge, inferentialism. Action well, I still. Theory. I mean, there, there's the one-two punch. I think Neander for, um, for for content, Jessica Wilson for mental causation. I think together there might be an interesting um, combination there. Well, that's where uh, we're going next, right? So yeah. we're doing both of those. Yeah, what do you think, Karen? We're, we'll do those two. Sounds good to me. <laughs> as long as the thermostat comes on. <laughs> <clears throat> Oh shit, we're recording. That's ridiculous. Okay.